from the nation's capital, the Mutual Broadcasting System presents the Peabody Award-winning Larry King Show, Network Radio's most listened to coast-to-coast -coast talk program, featuring guests from around the world and calls from all across America. And now, Larry King. Good evening, everybody. On this uh, Thursday night, Friday morning in Washington, D.C., the Larry King Show, coast-to-coast -coast on Mutual. Tonight, we look at... The John Birch Society. We will meet its chief spokesperson, the director of public relations for the society, John McManus. Like uh, Dr. Sagan last night, another fellow Brooklynite. Brooklyn is dominating the scene the latter part of the week on uh, this program. In his role as uh, director of public relations for the John Birch Society, Mr. McManus makes many of appearances on radio and television, uh, speaks with the Opinion Speakers Bureau, writes numerous articles and pamphlets. Writes a syndicated column called The Birch Log, which appears in a hundred newspapers. And he's one of the few authorized spokesmen for the John Birch Society. We'll talk about why that is underlined in a moment. The Larry King Show in Washington, D.C. And we welcome to our microphones John McManus, the official spokesperson of the John Birch Society. Why do they underline that, John, that you're one of the few authorized spokesmen? Are there unauthorized spokesmen? Oh, every member is an unauthorized spokesman, I guess. Uh... Well, why that's underlined is that uh, most people don't have a very high opinion of public relations men. And what I would prefer to be called is a, a spokesman for the organization rather than the title that they've given me called the public relations man. It's not that I uh, have anything against public relations men, but I think that uh, spokesman carries more clout, especially with people in your business. How long with the society? I've been a member since 1964. I joined the staff as one of our field coordinators in 1966. I'm in the position I hold today since six, since 1973. And they are based in Belmont, Massachusetts. I've noticed you got a little bit of a Massachusetts brogue. How could this happen to a Brooklyn? <laughs> this is like well, I left Brooklyn uh, to go to college in 1953, and I never returned to Brooklyn. In the meantime, my family moved out, and uh, I ended up marrying a girl from Boston, and I've settled there after a few years in the Marine Corps. And I guess it just happens. I've been accused of being a New Englander, and I've been accused of being a New Yorker. I guess you can find a little bit of each in me. You're a Holy Crossite, huh? Holy Cross grad, that's right. Unbeaten. But tied. But tied. <laughs> and hated Harvard. Well, Where is Belmont, Massachusetts? It's a suburb of Boston. It's right next to Cambridge. Has that always been the home of the Birch Society? Yes. The man who founded the John Birch Society is Robert Welsh. Uh, the candy. The candy, the Welsh candy uh, company. That's right. The fudge bars, the sugar daddies, and so forth. And he was living, the, the company was located in Cambridge, and he was living in Belmont, Massachusetts. And when he decided to separate himself from that company and start the John Birch Society, he just went down and he rented an office at a office building right next to the post office, and that's where, where we are today. He passed away, did he not? No, 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 no. Robert Welsh is still around. Robert Welsh is still around. I'm not a hero. <clears throat> well, Robert Welsh is now 83 years old. In fact, uh, before the month is over, uh, I guess December 1st, he'll be 84. Uh... He more or less moved upstairs back in March when uh, the society's leadership decided to create a couple of new positions. He had always been the chief executive officer. The only title he ever carried was founder, but he became chairman emeritus. And at the same time, just last March, Congressman Larry McDonald was named chairman, and a man named Thomas Hill, a longtime right-hand man of Robert Welsh, was named president. And, of course, I think most of your listeners are probably aware that our chairman was on the Korean airliner that went down over the I sea that. of Japan. I knew was a guest on this show a couple of years ago. Uh -huh. How many uh, John Birch Society members in Congress? He was the only one. There are none now. Uh -huh. yeah. what, uh, or what's the total membership? Close to 50,000. What brought John McManus to them? Uh, I became uh, somewhat of a conservative through reading various publications in the early 60s. I became concerned as to the socialistic drift in our country. It concerned me about communism and so forth. Uh, the John Birch Society began to get smeared in the early 1960s. I subscribed to it. I thought that what was being said made sense, that these people were screwballs and they were a blot on the American scene. And I actually wrote a letter one time to a magazine, and the magazine printed it where I condemned the society and I condemned the leader, Robert Welsh. It was printed in the magazine to my surprise. And then a member of the society got a hold of me, and he asked me a very good question. He, he wanted to know if I was basing my attitude about the society on what the society had said or what others had said of it. I thought that was a fair question, so I said, well, maybe not. Uh, maybe I haven't been doing this correctly. If you think that there's something I ought to see, I'll be happy to take a look at it. My intention was to show him how wrong he was, but the opposite happened. 
because many conservatives did attack the John Birch Society. William Buckley used to write regularly against the Birch Society. Dishonestly, we think. Dishonestly. Oh, yes. Quickly, it's named after who? It's named after John Birch, a young Christian missionary, went to China in 1940 from the state of Georgia. He served as a lieutenant and then a captain in the United States Army. He volunteered for service with General Claire Chenault and the Flying Tigers. Served with distinction behind the Japanese lines, speaking the Chinese language, living amongst the Chinese on their diet and so forth. Rescued General Jimmy Doolittle after the famous raid over Tokyo in 1942. Uh, John Birch was killed by Chinese communists in August of 1945, nine days after the war ended, while in the uniform of a captain in the United States Army. And Robert Welch eventually wrote a book called The Life of John Birch in 1954, told about this remarkable young American and the fact that his death had been suppressed and the information about it wasn't even given to his own parents in order to protect the Chinese communists uh, as agrarian reformers and not really as the enemies of civilization. The John Birch Society was formed when? 1958, when uh, Robert Welsh finally decided to form an information agency, and that's all we are. He asked the parents of John Birch if he could use their son's name. They said, uh, by all means, certainly. Uh, he had come to know them, uh, first from researching and then writing his book, and that's how we became the John Birch Society, and John Birch's dad is still living. Uh, he's in his 90s. In fact, uh, we expect to have him at our 25th anniversary celebration uh, in about a, four weeks in Indianapolis. Right back with John McManus, the chief spokesperson of the John Birch Society, after these messages. From the nation's capital, you're listening to The Larry King Show. Once again, here's Larry. And uh, our congratulations to Marvin Hagler, or Marvelous Marvin Hagler, that's his legal name. He retained his middleweight championship tonight with a surprising, surprising in that it went the full 15 rounds. Unanimous decision over Roberto Duran in Las Vegas. John McManus is our guest, official spokesperson <coughs> of the John Birch Society. Uh, my memory tells me that the main thing that got the John Birch Society painted as weirdo that may have led to your letter was Mr. Welch's charge that President Eisenhower was guilty of treason, as I remember it. What was that story? The story began in 1954 when Robert Welsh began to uh, write to some friends about information that he had about President Eisenhower that was uh, pretty much being covered up. And it eventually became a 300-page book that he didn't publish, that he simply shared with friends. It was all very damning information. Uh, I read the book in uh, 1964, and it so upset me that uh, for a couple of weeks I wasn't fit to live with, uh, according to my wife. The book is called The Politician, by the way. At the end of the book, Robert Welsh said that, uh, how do we explain these things? Uh, how do we explain many things, like Eisenhower choosing a known communist to ghostwrite his book, uh, Crusade in Europe, a man named Joseph Fels Barnes? Eisenhower responsible for two to five million people being shipped back to certain slavery and many of them to death uh, with Operation Keelhaul, the refugees from communism and, and uh, the betrayal of the Hungarian Revolution and so many things. But uh, Robert Welsh never intended that the book be published as it was. A copy was lost or stolen and it wound up in the hands of enemies and they used it. Uh, he, at the end of the book, said, if the history is disturbing to the reader and myself, don't blame him who wrote it, blame him who made it. And he said that, uh, as far as he could see, explaining this situation, you would have to decide that he was either a naive man, Eisenhower, or he was a willing opportunist, or he was a conscious agent of the communist conspiracy, and any other solution that you might want to come up with uh, would uh, certainly uh, not upset me. You would agree, wouldn't you, though, that from a public relations standpoint, the society was greatly damaged by that with Eisenhower's popularity. Would it have been smart to have Mr. Welch come down on the side of naivete? Well, see, the book was already written, Larry. Uh, it was actually written, and it was being circulated amongst friends of Robert Welch before he formed the John Birch Society. Now, he intended at a later time to publish the book, and he would have published it, and probably uh, a, a book that uh, would have been published would have been more palatable to the public. I don't know, but uh, what he finally had to do after taking it on the chin for two full years was to publish it just as is. And he did. He took out a full-page ad in the New York Times announcing its publication, and he sent that ad to bookstores all over the United States, but it was already such a hot thing that nobody would touch it, and yet anybody who did would have been able to sell all kinds of copies. 
So there have been several hundred thousand copies of that book distributed. People have read it all across the country, and the book stands on itself. And I would recommend people to read it today, very much so. What do you believe? What do I believe? Re Eisenhower. Of Eisenhower? I tend towards a willing opportunist theory. I think that there are people in our country and throughout our history who are willing to subvert any principles that you might expect in the ordinary human being in order to promote themselves. Now, what, of course, I'm saying here is that uh, it is... Uh, it is the way to promote yourself, uh, uh, the way to promote yourself is to go left, to uh, help to destroy your country. I believe that that is the case. It has been the case for quite a long time. It's still the case today in many, in many uh, areas, and that's one of the reasons why there's a John Birch Society. You believe that left would destroy and right would... Uh protect and defend? Well, uh, I mean, that you believe that left then would be well, a me, conscious me, destroyer of the values of well, the system? Well, I, I, I think socialism would destroy any worthwhile civilization. I think that's left. Socialism or communism? Well, socialism and communism to me are very, very similar. Uh, the communists themselves don't call themselves communists, they call themselves socialists, all right? So you could very uh, smartly dis describe a communist as a socialist with a club. Uh, and I think that makes some sense. So I think they're the same. Uh, I don't particularly like the other end of the spectrum either, which is the right wing, and that would be anarchy, no government. I think left wing is total government. I think right wing is no government. Uh, as a sidelight, let me say that I would therefore put the Nazis on the left wing, uh, national socialists, total totalitarians, total government, left wing. I, I think that makes all kinds of sense. Uh, I don't particularly uh, like the John Birch Society being classified as a right-wing organization or ultra-right or something like that. No, I think the John Birch Society has a justifiable claim to being constitutional moderates. We believe in the middle. We believe in limited self-government. We believe that the government should be limited by law and that people should be limited by freely accepted moral codes like the Ten Commandments. What does the, the society do? Is it a lobbying organization? No, it's not. It's simply educational. We are an information agency, and all we ask of the American people or anybody is that they take a look at what we have to say and factor into it, uh, factor into their consciousness what our positions are, what our information is, along with whatever other inputs they want. If they do that, they'll find that there's a difference, and then they can make a choice. Uh, do you support candidates? No. Don't back candidates, don't support them, not even members of the John Birch Society when they run for office. We're very scrupulous about that. In fact, we recently had to defend ourselves from charges by the Federal Election Commission, had to spend over $100,000 in legal costs to defend ourselves from the charge that we were, in fact, political. And we won the case, and the judge in New York who ruled on the case, a panel of nine judges, the chief judge said that he found the operations of the Federal Election Commission to be somewhat perverse. And it was. It was a it was a classic case of them hounding us with our own tax dollars. Are you supported by contributions of the membership? Dues and contributions of the members. And sale of books. Uh, uh, we have several corporations. We have a weekly news magazine. We have a, uh, a, week, a monthly uh, American opinion magazine. Uh, we we have a speakers bureau. We we you know anything you would expect of an educational organization. We you have not been as much in the news of late until the shooting down of that airliner. Would you have agreed? Oh yes, right. Why not? Well, the time that the John Birch Society was in the news was when we were being smeared, and you could you could add them up, and you'd find a thousand smears a week of the John Birch Society. We were secret. We were fascist. We were subversive. We were anti-Semitic. We were anti-Negro. Uh, we were racist. We were this. We were that. Everything. We were like the Klan. We were like the communists. I, I've heard them all. None of it makes any sense. If you, if you understand the society, if you look at the society, and there's no basis for those charges. But uh, it was around 1966, in fact, that all of a sudden the, that stopped. That was helping us. Keeping us in the news was helping the society. More people were coming to us and saying, nobody can be that bad. Hmm. Or they were adopting the attitude that we sometimes uh, wish that the German people had adopted. Hitler had written a book. Would that the German people had read his book. They would have stopped what he intended to do. A lot of people said, we'd better read the Birch's book. So they read our book, and they joined the society, the blue book of the John Birch Society, and some of the other things that, that happened. So all of that was helping us, and then it stopped. Now, another thing about why we haven't been in the press is that the John Birch Society is not the kind of an organization that goes down to the media and asks the media to carry its message to the public. We don't do that. We go on shows like yours, certainly. We go on, and I travel the country. I appear on radio and television and so forth. 
But we've decided long ago that the mass media in the country was already doing a bad job. That's why we formed the John Birch Society, to be a new medium of information. And so we go about our business ourselves. We cooperate where we can, but we don't rely on it. And consequently, we're not like a lot of other organizations that are even remotely similar who pay obeisance to the press and try to get the press to help them and are constantly seeking attention from the press. And, and therefore, it seems to some people in the press that we've kind of faded away and don't exist anymore. Not so. Have more members than you ever had? Mm, probably close to about as many as we've ever had in our history, but we're down a little. We're down. We've come up. Uh, uh, since the death of Congressman McDonald, we've come up. But you it was take a heavy stands price on all major issues? Pretty much, yes. Without endorsing candidates, you take stands? Yes. Domestic and international. That's right. Now, we also urge our members to be good citizens and to get involved in the political process. And they do. And when a bircher gets involved in the political process, it's, it's quite effective because he knows what he wants. He's very determined. And he has good information, and he becomes quite a, an asset or a detriment in a political scene. But he does that not without, uh, all by himself, without any direction from us as to go for this candidate or that candidate. You describe yourself as moderate. Most moderates would say that uh, they accept many of the social progressive reforms of the New Deal, uh, things like Social Security, eventually Medicare, Civil Rights Act. Uh, indeed, some uh, neoconservatives, George Will and others, accept that this is a way of life in America, that America is large, that it has to have needs. And they are in part socialistic. Social Security is socialistic, but they were necessary to the growth of the, of the land, and they call themselves moderate. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. I think that socialism is a detriment to civilization. Uh, I know that uh, uh, especially the really liberal Republicans love to cover themselves with the term moderate. They're moderate Republicans. They're not uh, what they call right-wing Republicans. Well, these are all labels. Now, when I said that we're, we're in the, we're a mo we consider ourselves constitutional moderates, I mean that we're in the middle of the political spectrum. We don't believe in no government anarchy. We don't believe in total government, socialism, communism. Do you accept any of the social reforms of the New Deal? I don't see any of them are any good. Now, you don't let like me Social Security. No, let me give like you civil rights Well, let me let me like tell Medicare. you why. I'm in favor of people being cared for in their old age. I'm in favor of people being taken care of in the medical sense and, and fed when they're hungry and clothed and housed and everything else. But I don't think government should do it. Who should do it? I think people should do it. I think that if at the the history of this country is one where we're second to none in the history of mankind for private charity. But when government got involved in this business, then all of a sudden we had 10,000 times the number of people who needed charity. What if people don't do it? What if, for example, someone in New York does do it and someone in Mississippi doesn't, so that a kid in Mississippi doesn't have food, but a kid in New York does? I How just, is that fair? I, I, I just don't see it happening, but uh, I don't know that it's fair or unfair. I think the people in Mississippi are are uh, no less charitable than the people in New York and vice versa. I think that uh, the American spirit of, of helping the downtrodden is very, very admirable, and I don't think that starvation was ever a problem in the United States. Well, then, what led to the passage of all these acts? We had something called a depression, and in that depression, what you were just outlining was impossible. Well, what, let's go back, and what caused the depression, Larry? Uh, there are people who want to say it was the evolution of economic forces, and it was absolutely something It was a a flaw in the free enterprise system. We don't believe that at all. We believe that the depression was deliberately brought on by people for the purpose of destroying this country. People like Herbert Hoover? And no, not Alvin people Coolidge. like Herbert. People like J.P. Morgan. Why would he want to destroy? In order to, in order to uh, build over the ashes of it a civilization that he himself would control and run and, and absolutely uh, manipulate. And it, it began when the, when the Morgan interests and others established the central bank, the Federal Reserve System, in 1913. That's, that happens to be plank number five in the Communist Manifesto. And when they did that, it gave them the, the capability of boom and bust. Increase the money supply, we get a boom. Depress it, we get a bust. Up me, and down. Right there. We'll pause for news headlines, come right back. Many people calling in early. If you want to do so, it's a good idea to dial in now. We'll take everybody in order. We'll be right back on the Mutual Broadcasting System, your network for news and sports. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
from the nation's capital, you're listening to The Larry King Show. Portions of this program are repeated in the Pacific Time Zone. Once again, Network Radio's number one interviewer, Larry King. My guest is John McManus, Director of Public Relations, Chief Spokesperson for the John Birch Society. His weekly Birch Log column appears in 100 papers. He's written a new uh, a mini book called The Insiders, a look at the powerful few who really dictate America's policies. We will ask about that in a moment. It deals with the Trilateral Commission and also the Birch Society's unhappiness with both the Carter and Reagan administrations, by the way, seeing much more similarities than differences uh, between the two. Uh, you favor no socialistic concept at all. Larry, when you boil it down to it, it's what you're talking about is this. Governments were created by people. When the people created the governments, they gave to the governments powers that they themselves had, such as the power to defend themselves, and they asked the government to do it. And that's proper. People can give to a government that they create powers that they themselves possess. But you don't and I don't possess the power to reach into a, a neighbor's wallet and to take out of it and give to a third person what that neighbor has. Except through elected representatives, we well, asserted that in some areas we would do that. Okay. That, to me, is an absolute perversion of what government is all about. I don't think that government should be in the business of doing things for people. Government should simply be in the business of protecting our rights. And when you get a government that starts to redistribute the wealth, which is what's going on in America today, you very soon destroy that civilization and you end up with total government power. How come more Americans are better off today since we've had all this socialism enter than pre we're having all this socialism? We have no we're living sweatshops. On we have no people making a buck an hour anymore. We're living on borrowed time, Larry. The deficits in this country are going to destroy the future. And if they don't stop, if we don't reverse the course and get back to sound money, and, and uh, we will absolutely destroy the future for ourselves and especially for our children. We're living in a fool's paradise, and everybody's living high on the hog. It's almost like the Roaring Twenties that came crashing down when they all of a sudden decided to call in the broker loans and precipitate the Depression. Um, how about civil rights? You said the nation... We're very much in favor of what is called civil rights. Very much in favor of it, but we don't believe that the federal government should have been doing these things. Who should have been doing those things? Well, let's, let's be specific. Let's talk about voting rights. Voting rights were denied to a significant number of Americans, mostly with black skin, uh, especially through the South. Uh, nobody can deny that. There's a provision in the Constitution of the United States that says if the if a particular state denies to a significant portion of its members uh, the franchise, then it shall have its congressional representation reduced proportionately. In other words, if you've got 50 percent blacks, you don't let them vote. If you have six congressmen, then the federal government has the, the right and the power to say, all right, now you have three. How did that help the blacks? If well, you did it didn't because nobody even tried it. Nobody but if you had done that, how would it have helped? Well, it would have helped. The, it certainly would have gotten the attention of any state when you reduce their, their representation in Congress. Why by, not do the better half. thing and just see that everybody gets the right to vote? Well, I don't think everybody should. I think there, ought, think to be, any, I don't, I think there ought to be qualifications. I don't want to set those qualifications. But our founding fathers were wise enough to set to to leave it up to the states to set the qualifications, and they also expected that the competition among states to be the best state in the union would be a very good thing, competition producing excellence, and it would lead to uh, the kind of thing that you and I would hope for. Uh, and and I think it would have eventually worked out even through the South. But some states had poll taxes, and that's some states gave different tests to whites than they gave to blacks. Well, that's wrong, and they violated their own laws in doing it, and they could have been held for that and they should have been held for that. Don't you think the Bill of Rights gave the federal government the right to ensure the individual rights of every American? Uh, yeah, but they didn't include voting as one of the Bill of Rights. But did the they? Amendment to the Constitution did. Well, all right, then, then, then all right, let's you know, go on to the amendments. The right. All right, so look, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that there were problems, and there will always be problems. But I don't think the answer to the problems is more federal power. What we have now is the federal government setting the standards, and therefore there are virtually no standards. We have people who can't read English voting. We have people who uh, who uh, uh, don't even know what the candidates are all about that are being lined up, and, and uh, it's being suggested to them that this is the guy who's going to help you. And the whole attitude has been created that the thing to do is to vote for the guy who's going to help you and not the guy who is going to help the country. Now, wouldn't you come down, let's say, all the bad in that, wouldn't you come down in favor of that over the denial of the right to vote. 
to any American. Well, I thought that there were procedures that should have been followed. They weren't. All these people who were covering themselves with glory and saying that we're in favor of the Constitution, we're in favor of this and so forth, I just don't believe it. What they did was I think they took a great leap forward to destroying a lot of what this country was supposed to be. What disappoints you in this administration? Oh, the rhetoric is very appealing. The performance is what dis disappoints me. Uh, you think it's an administration continuing a socialistic tract? Yes. Look at the deficits today. I mean, uh, I don't. I hope many of your listeners understand what deficits mean. Deficits down the road always translate into uh, inflation and high interest rates, because when the federal government borrows, they have to get it from one or two sources. One source is to borrow it, and if they borrow a lot of money, then there's a lot less borrowable money for you or me to buy a car or a home or whatever. Well, why do you think that's true? Mr. Reagan was certainly an outstanding conservative spokesperson. He uh, ran on the most conservative plank the Republicans have had since the Goldwater uh, defeat in 64. Uh, he, uh, I guess, was the key proponent of conservatism in this country. Did well, he, he was, he was uh, certainly uh, widely reputed to be that. But uh, you'll read in my book there an analysis that was made of him by a man at the Hoover Institute where he said that Reagan was not a conservative when he was the governor of California, that the rhetoric was always very appealing and the performance was socialistic. And I believe that, and I knew that for going way back. I think that, uh, that the American people have been given one heck of a good snow job regarding this man. Now, you chose on the back of this to uh, show a picture, a friendly picture, of Ronald Reagan and David Rockefeller. Actually, that was intended to attack Mr. Reagan. What do you have against David Rockefeller? Uh, other than the fact that uh, David Rockefeller uh, is amassing tremendous power uh, and, and seems to want to rule the world, uh, I think he's a fine fellow. He seems to want to rule the world. I, I think that that, uh, that that accusation will be borne up by, by uh, the performance. Uh, David Rockefeller... Uh, it's not, it's not by chance that David Rockefeller is the favorite banker in Moscow and the favorite banker in Peking. It's not by chance that David Rockefeller is the head of the Trilateral Commission and the head of the Council on Foreign Relations, which has such a, a lockstep grip on our country. Uh, it's not without uh, uh, significance that uh, both of those organizations, in our view, based on their history, on their, their, uh, their roots, their, the people who formed them, the, the, the whole thrust of the organization, that those organizations are working to build a one-world socialist system and that these people are the ones that help to dignify the communists, to aid the communists, to build them up, to uh, see to it that the United States government supplies them with uh, money and food and technology and equipment and computers to run their missile programs and everything else. In other words, uh, we think it's a, it's a very sinister operation. A couple of things in that regard. How does one-worldism or socialism benefit David Rockefeller? Uh, a banker. You tend to think of the man uh, like David Rockefeller as somebody who's simply in things to uh, to be uh, the businessman, to uh, amass a buck or to amass more bucks than he already has. We look at it a little bit differently. We know that wealth is power, but we also know that absolute power comes politically. And that's what we believe we see here, a power grab, a very sinister power grab that is lining up country after country. We believe that, that it's not uh, uh, by chance that America has been brought down and the Soviet Union has been brought up so that uh, eventually we might become indistinguishable and be merged. In fact, there have been people who stated that that was their goal. Prominent people, the head of the Ford Foundation in 1953, stated it exactly in those terms and then later denied that he said it, but the man who he said it to uh, is a credible individual. Well, Linda Johnson once said, wouldn't it be nice if the Soviet Union adopted some of our methods, we've adopted some of the socialist methods, and the two nations could live as superpowers in peace rather than with constant rhetoric and saber-rattling? Well, Isn't that a good idea? No, I don't think so at all. No. I don't think the United States should sacrifice its its principles and so forth, and I don't think we should trust that the Russians would uh, would do whatever... Uh, they seem to have promised. And you think Mr. Reagan's er interest in that area is all rhetoric then? Uh, yes, and I think the record is very clear on this. Uh, lo look at the shooting down of the Korean airliner. What did we see? We, uh, we got some very good rhetoric out of President Reagan. Uh, what what for performance? Well, performance, he, he sent a couple of Aeroflot employees out of the country for a few days. 
And then he sent uh, George Shultz, the Secretary of State, over to Madrid to sit across a table from Gromico and snarl at each other for the cameras. And then our Secretary of State, within a week of the shooting down of the Korean airliner, signed an extension of the Helsinki Accords that were engineered by Henry Kissinger during the Ford administration. I think that's because we determined that there was a mistake of one ground commander and that uh, and drop-off certainly didn't order the shooting down of that airliner since it didn't benefit him at all to well, shoot down that airliner. Well, I don't know that it didn't benefit him. I didn't benefit him. Well, I think that the, the, the murder of Larry McDonald was a very significant thing. And, you and think Andropov was worried about Larry McDonald? I think that when you start to solve a crime, you ask yourself who benefits from the crime if you're looking for a, a suspect here. And, and who benefits? Well, here's a man who is this Larry McDonald, was the head of the John Burt Society, I think significant, uh, was the uh, uh, head of the Western Goals Foundation that he'd begun in Washington, D.C., begun to produce anti-communist videotapes and programs that were already being shown on cable television nationally, uh, publishing books as well. Also, the leading anti-communist in the United States Congress, according to friend and foe alike. Also, a man who had coalesced the activities of a lot of organizations on the conservative anti-communist side of the fence, why not then just hire an agent, murder him on a Washington street, rather than kill all these other people and bring debasement upon yourself? Because, Larry, strangely enough, the communists would want the world to know that they did it. Now, I don't know that that's exactly the case. That is a surmise. It's a surmise that I think has a lot of merit. We suspect that that's the reason. We haven't stated it fully. We just don't know. But is it also possible that, that somebody would be as absolutely... Uh, barbaric enough to want to kill one person and to take 268 others along uh, and kill them in the process. That certainly is fully in keeping with the Soviet Union. Uh, they've murdered tens of millions in this, in this 20th century alone. John McManus is the guest, the official spokesperson of the John Birch Society. He's written a new book published by the Society called The Insiders. All of our lines are going, and we'll be going to the calls shortly, and we'll be back after these messages. Again, here's Larry. With John McManus of the John Birch Society, <coughs> this book, The Insiders, deals with the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. It lists also all the memberships of each organization. And if you look at the membership of the, it would be hard to find famous Americans. Not, I mean, uh, Richard Nixon was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, you have some a lot of prominent the people. The top belong. people in the media, the top people in the military, education, clergy, you think that's all government. Plot? Larry, you we say people we say we say in the book that not every member of either or both of those organizations is necessarily a conspirator of any kind. But we believe that the thrust of the organizations and certainly obviously some of the people in those organizations we believe to be uh, determined to build power for themselves at the expense of the freedom of everyone else. Um, if you'd hand me the book, let me read one or two quotes out of it. I can find them real quick. Uh, you have a man named uh, uh, Richard Gardner, who was a uh, former Columbia University professor. I think he's back there now, but he's been in and out of government. He wrote an, an article in the Foreign Affairs magazine, and that's the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations. This is April 1974. What he called it was the hard road to world order. He said that he admits that a single leap into world government being an organization like the United Nations is unrealistic. Instead, he urged continued piecemeal delivery of our nation's sovereignty to a variety of international organizations. He called for, quote, an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece. That means an end to nations, our nation's sovereignty. Then he named his organizations to accomplish his goal of building this world order the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the uh, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the Law of the Sea Conference, the World Population Conference, United Nations Military Force, and so forth. He then said this approach, quote, can produce some remarkable concessions of sovereignty that could not be achieved on an across-the-board basis. Now, I, there are many, many, many Americans who are not uh, treasonous who believe in giving up some sovereignty, for example. Nationalism, as it not, I'm sure you'd agree, has produced a lot of the world's great problems. The Hitler who you referred to was more nationalistic than you are. Well, he was uh, a nationalist. Tojo was a nationalist. Right. Well, he was very, he was the strongest anti communist alive at the time, wanted to invade the Soviet Union, asked us to fight with him. Um, so, now, when you give up certain sovereignty in the hope that world order will bring world peace, 
Why is it essential that we control all sovereignty unto ourselves? Because we say that, and the Soviet Union says that, and Germany says that, and Japan says that, and Grenada says that, and this says that. All you have is constant people at each other's throats. No, you don't, Larry. No more than you do if you have on a street somewhere in a suburb of any town or even in the middle of the city, you have a street and you have 40 different families living on that street. Each one of them is sovereign in their own home. Governed by one mayor. Governed by, well, all right, those people in their own homes are sovereign. All right, and and their their property is theirs, and so forth. That doesn't mean that they're infringing on the rights or that they're warring with their neighbors. Their neighbors are also sovereign in in the family sense, in just that one plot of land. Nations should be the same way. And if you are a sovereign nation, that doesn't mean that you necessarily are going to be warring with anybody else. I think that whole attitude is wrong. But what we're saying here is that yes, indeed. Hitler was nationalistic. He tried to restore German pride on the backs of a lot of other people. But what about the what about this country? This country has its faults. We've talked about some of them. But when you assess this country in the history of mankind, you come up with something that is absolutely remarkable. You start off this nation by saying men are endowed by their creator with rights. That's the Declaration of Independence. And then they said that to secure these rights, governments are formed. So here, for the first time in history, you have God on top, individuals next, and governments on the bottom. Where did the people get their rights? Not from government, which is what most of the kids in the schools believe today, but they got them from God. If they got them from God, government can't take them away, and the whole American system, the whole American tradition is remarkable. Why didn't the Constitution mention God? It didn't have to. Why didn't it? Because it was simply the establishment of a government. The, the, the philosophy of the United States is not just the Constitution, it's the Declaration. The Declaration is the definition of our country. That's the Declaration. The Constitution is the law. That's right, but the and, Declaration uh, the of Independence... God, the, which I count on. The Declaration of Independence four times mentions a deity, and the Declaration of Independence is the philosophy upon which they later built a government system called the Constitution. How do you know God didn't like socialism? Because he said, thou shalt not steal. No, that's not a good answer. Oh, How do you know why God not? God didn't like socialism. Why not? What is socialism? I think it's stealing. I think socialism is me getting government to reach into your pocket to give to me or to my friends. By common agreement through elected representatives. No, it's not by common agreement. No, it's not by common agreement at all. There's an awful lot of Americans that don't agree that the government should should reach into their pocket and take all of their money in taxation and redistribute the wealth and give foreign aid to communists and so forth. I don't believe that that's a good idea. Now, I submit to it because uh, if I don't, I can't fight against these things and get these laws repealed from the inside of a jail. But I think it's stealing. And I think that the, the answer that I gave you, which seemed to be a little bit flip, is not really. It's the absolute substance of the situation. God didn't like socialism, and I think the reason that we can say that is he said, thou shalt not steal. You think he liked capitalism? I don't know. Uh, see, we don't distinguish. We don't, we don't make the distinction here between communism or socialism and capitalism. What we say is capital is the means of production. And I think everybody would admit that that's the definition of capital. If that is true, then everybody is a capitalist. And then the distinction that has to be made is between who owns, controls, and uses the capital. Is it monopolistic state-controlled capitalism, a la communism and socialism, or is it competitive free enterprise capitalism, a la the free enterprise system? You would therefore favor uh, government regulatory commissions that prevent monopolies. I, I think that that's one of government's purposes. But, but the problem is that most of the government regulatory agencies that have been created over the years are the ones that actually create monopolies. We'll be right back. We're going to go to your calls in a couple of moments for John McManus, the official spokesperson of the John Birch Society. First, this message. The Larry King Show. Once again, here's Larry. With John McManus of the John Birch Society. If uh, Reagan can be equated in this same camp with the others, where is your political hope? Well, our, our, our attitude, Larry, is that the insiders that I've written about in this little book and anybody can get it, just send two bucks to the John Birch Society, Belmont, Massachusetts, 02178, and you can get the book. We'll send along a couple of leaflets as well. But our attitude is that these influences have a, a grip on the uh, presidency and that the way to uh, right the wrongs is to get a decent Congress, that the grip does not reach down to the congressional and most of the senatorial level. And our attitude is that if you had a good Congress, it wouldn't matter really who your president was. How would you gather that they would have in both the same camp Reagan and Ted Kennedy? 
I mean, how, how is that feasible to logical thinking? Well, look at the people who surround them, Larry. That's, that's the key. Uh, when Reagan became the nominee, he selected trilateralist CFR member George Bush for his running mate. He, George Bush and Kennedy couldn't be farther apart on almost every oh, issue? Oh, no, I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. In fact, I think Kennedy is small potatoes in this thing. I don't think Kennedy is as important a man as he liked to think himself. I think that, uh, generally speaking, the power brokers don't really have much confidence in Ted Kennedy. And I think that's probably a good idea because I don't think he's a very able man. And they hatch this? I mean, this to your, th your conception is a plot? I think it, well, yes. Uh, look, the, the opposite of uh, things happening by design is that everything happens by accident. And that's absurd. So we think that, yes, when things happen, they happen because men want them to happen. But the and when Reagan, when Reagan crusades as a candidate against the Trilateral Commission and against these influences and then selects Donald Reagan for Treasury from the CFR and Caspar Weinberger for Defense from the Trilateral Commission and Alexander Haig and then George Shultz from the Council on Foreign Relations for Secretary of State and Malcolm Baldrige from the Council on Foreign Relations for Secretary of Commerce and William Casey as the head of the CIA and, and so forth, then we say, okay, the pattern continues. George Shultz happens to be the tenth Secretary of State in a row from the Council on Foreign Relations. And all, remember all the fuss was made about George Shultz and Weinberger both being from Bechtel? Uh, the Bechtel connection, my golly, horrors, horrors, horrors. Nobody said, except the Birch Society, said that, wait a minute, these fellas are all from the Council on Foreign Relations, the tenth in a row, going back to Dean Acheson. How about when the Council on Foreign Relations publishes opinions that are contrary? They, in, in, pub, in, their, in foreign affairs, there are very often articles one month completely different with articles the month after it. And well, there's a lot of disagreement. Well, there's disagreement about how to get to a common goal, I think. I don't think that the articles are, are, are the type of articles that you'd find in our magazine. Not at all. And I've read it. I've looked it over quite frequently. I find a lot of the articles uh, good to uh, cure insomnia, but uh, I also find some of them very significant. I found, for instance, that Richard Nixon in 1967, when he was supposed to be such an anti-communist, wrote an article there calling for an opening to Red China. What we ought to, This is even while the war in Vietnam was going on. Asia after Vietnam in 1967, he endeared himself to these people, and then he became president in 1968 and completely turned the tables on his supporters and went to Red you don't China. think it was smart to go to Red China? Oh, I think it was absolutely terrible to go with his hat in his hand and exchange gifts and felicitations and honors in your name and mine with the bloodiest murderers that the world has ever known. We will now pause for news on the hour, a word from your local stations, and your opportunity to talk to John McManus, the official spokesman of the uh, John Birch Society. <laughs> From the nation's capital, Mutual Radio presents The Larry King Show, Network Radio's leading coast-to-coast -coast talk program. Call Larry now at 703-685-2177. That's 703-685-2177. Let the connection ring. We'll answer when it's your turn. And now, Network Radio's number one interviewer, Larry King. Welcome back to another hour of the Larry King Show, Coast to Coast on Mutual. My special guest tonight is John McManus, longtime member of the John Birch Society, joined the staff in 1966. The Society, by the way, will be 25 years old in a month. We'll hold a major celebration in Indianapolis for that event. He writes the syndicated Birch Log, a weekly column. He's one of the few authorized spokesmen for the Society. He's written a recent book called The Insiders, which you can obtain from the Society in Belmont, Massachusetts. If you write to them at 02178, the fee is $2 for the book, and they'll also send you materials. <coughs> Tomorrow night, Hedrick Smith and David Shipler of the New York Times. We're ready to go to your phone calls for John McManus. We start with Edison, New Jersey. Hello. Hi. Good morning, Larry. Good morning. Uh, Mr. McManus? Yes. Uh, I'd like to have a quote, please, and I'd like to mention two world socialists. Quote, I am thy brother's keeper, end of quote, from the Holy Bible and the founder of Christianity named Jesus Christ, who shared all his, all his worldly beings with his fellow human beings, and Pope John Paul II, my classmate in Poland, were socialists then. How do you figure these people adopted a socialist philosophy, these great world le le religious leaders, if mankind was not in need of help from one another? Well, sir, you, you quote Christ as saying, I am not my brother's keeper, and say that that is the equivalent of socialism, and I certainly dispute that. 
I don't think that uh, there's any mention of government there. I think that my brother's keeper means that, yes, I have a responsibility to help my fellow man, but not to channel it through government and not to have government take over people's responsibilities right, how in about that field. Pope John Paul, who says that we all owe to see that nobody starves, that all nations owe other nations, that food should be transported everywhere, and that the dollar should not be the number one goal of people, but helping people. Well, I, I don't think that the dollar should be the number one goal of people either, and I think people should help people. But if, if, if you're going to quote to me something that the Pope John Paul said that says that governments should take over this responsibility... Well, he calls then, on governments that, all the time to Well, do then it. you will find this very loyal Catholic saying, I disagree. Thank you very much. Stuart, Florida. Hello. Hello, Mr. King. Hi. Mr. McManus. Yes. In uh, several conservative readings that I've undertaken, I have seen a difference cited between a constitutional republic and a democracy. Right. I have never had it clearly explained to me in the readings what that difference is. You know, I give a whole... With that philosophy, sir, and if so, could you explain that difference? Well, it takes a little longer than a few minutes to do it, but I give a whole talk on this. In fact, uh, my seminar called An Overview of Our World, I'm giving it in... Cincinnati next Tuesday night at the I think it's the Holiday Inn North, and uh, people are you have a Cincinnati outlet probably if anybody yeah, if anybody's interested out there I think it's at 7:30 at the Holiday North and well in essence, we'll go into that the the difference the, first of all the, the Constitution of the United States establishes a republic a rule of law democracy is the rule of a majority if you allow the majority to rule then anybody's rights are up for grabs the majority can do whatever they want. There was nothing our founding fathers feared more than democracy. James Madison said, democracies are as short in their lives as they are violent in their deaths. We want nothing to do with democracy. None of our founding fathers wanted it. They knew what had happened in Greece, where democracy led to tyranny. They knew what had happened in Rome, where they had a republic. It degenerated to a democracy, and it led to tyranny there as well. And so they very wisely gave us the rule of law. The whole purpose of the government was to have the government ruled by law and to have the individuals rule themselves by freely accepted moral codes like the Ten Commandments. That's the difference. Thank you very much. We go to Buffalo, New York with John McManus. Hello. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, in 1933, the Russians murdered 7 million Ukrainians. Um, and in that very same year, for some reason, FDR decided to uh, finally grant political recognition to the so-called Soviet Union. And violating his campaign promises to do it, too. Well, he did it anyway. Yeah. Ever since then, right up until the uh, even the Helsinki Accords, we have uh, tended to legitimatize the uh, existence of Russian imperialism. Uh, why is it that we have uh, you know, turned our backs and completely ignored the aspirations of 150 million non-Russian prisoners in the, you know, the so-called Soviet Union. Well, sir, I'll go you one better and say we not only turned our backs on these people, we helped the Soviet Union into existence. We kept them in existence. We built them into a world power, and we have built their nuclear capabilities today. But if you didn't recognize them, therefore it meant you wouldn't talk to them, well, and you wouldn't exchange ambassadors. And that's if right. two people and, and are on opposite sides with nuclear weapons don't talk to each other, that's safe guarantee you've got a war. No, no. I don't believe that at all, Larry. I don't you don't think, communicate. I don't think that there's anything to be gained from communicating with a Soviet... You don't uh, think so? No. Then I what's your answer? The answer is to sever diplomatic relations with them right, and, and stop what? sitting down and making agreements and stop helping them. All right, don't make agreements, don't, don't do make it. Then, agreements. then what does that lead to? Give it, me the play the scene out. Play the scene out is this. We stop supplying them with the computers to run their missile systems. We stop giving them the sophisticated electronics and the ball bearings to merv their missiles, the electronics that, that, uh, that I've already mentioned. We stop giving them the money. We stop giving them the food and paying the bills to give them the food. We stop giving them all kinds of legitimacy. And we stop making agreements with them that we keep and they break to their advantage over and over and over and over again Can and anybody who will make another agreement with a communist is to me either a fool or a, himself a conspirator we have a commission that investigates all and they reported recently to the reagan administration there have been no breaks on either side in the last twenty years of any major nuclear treaty the salt one was broken salt two was broken what others oh, are there they? were charges they were broken well i i think those charges are very easy to substantiate Okay, we go to New York City. Hello. Yes, I'd like to see whether Mr. McManus agrees with this statement. Uh, over the last two decades, the 60s and 70s, inflation caused by big spending liberals in Congress have made 80% of the workers' salaries in this country worth less than it was 20 years ago. And therefore, those 80 million people and their families comprise about two-thirds of all the Americans are actually 
poorer than they were 20 years ago due to this inflation. Well, I agree with the sentiment. I don't think I'd accept all the figures. I think that in well, 20 maybe technology that increased. Well, in 20 years' time, I think the do the value of the dollar has probably gone down about two thirds, and that value was stolen from the people by the government through a very clever process called inflation. John McManus is our guest of the John Birch Society. Back after these messages from the nation's capital, you're listening to the Larry King Show. Once again. Here's Larry. With John McManus of the John Birch Society, Philadelphia. Hello. Uh, hi. Um, I have the opinion that uh, the United States is losing its sovereignty in the following way, in that we cannot, we can no longer control our borders effectively. And I was wondering if I could get a comment. That's true. Uh, we are having trouble with the borders. But there's a significant story there. If you follow the programs of Senator Edward Kennedy and Mondale and some of these other characters, you will do to the United States what has already been done to Mexico, and the Mexican people like it so much that there are now 12 million of them living in Southern California. Where do we go? If these people are successful, if the rhetoric of the Reagan continues and the performance is very little different from what Mondale and Kennedy want themselves, then that will be done to America, and where do we go? There's no place else to go. Now you know why there's a John Birch Society, to try to shake the, the, the bushes of America and, and wake the town and tell the people. Is there a major American political figure speaking not as the society but as yourself that you like? Oh, there are quite a few senators I think are doing a fine job. Uh, uh, several dozen uh, congressmen, several score congressmen that I think do a, do a fine job. Uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, hello. Hello. I think uh, the state of Israel, or not the state of Israel, but a, a Jewish state, was and is necessary for Jewish survival. And as the world gets smaller, I think a white Christian state will be necessary, hopefully, in the United States as the Spanish migration increases. And uh, You want to put blacks in certain places? Is that it, sir? Well, uh, well part of it is the, the uh, political ascendancy of blacks in the United States. I thought we were all Americans. Well, I mean... Like, where are you from? Jews were Germans, but... It's where, where are you from? Good. Well, you're you're not a Native American. I'm saying I'm saying I'm just like you to answer the. Like, All right, John. Uh, what's the question? I don't know. States uh, that there be a white state. No, I don't know for that. I, one of the features of the United States that I love so much is its melting pot atmosphere. It's uh, it's mm -hmm. widely divergent uh, numbers of people. Beloit, Wisconsin. Hello. Uh, is the John Birch Society at all concerned with the? communist influence in the Catholic Church in Central America and in the United States? Yes, it is. Yes, what have it, you done on that? Uh, we've published information about that. They recently, uh, in one of our magazines, did a piece about the Marinole and the control of the Marinoles in the hands of absolute Marxists, uh, those their, the their publications. That, weren't those the ones that were murdered and everybody's crying about that uh, the people in, what is it, El Salvador haven't been brought to justice for killing Don't, don't you cry over any murder, sir? Not of communists. You, you, in other words, the, those nuns don't bother you. I want to know if they were. Communist. You think those nuns were communists, John? I don't think so. No. No. No, I don't think that. I think they were being used. Cleveland, hello. Hi, Larry. Good show. Thank you. I've got uh, two questions for uh, Mr. Mc, uh, McManus. McManus. Uh, first, I'd like to know. I'm a young conservative. I want to know what his uh, feelings are about uh, Bob uh, Bauman whether or not he's a truly a conservative and whether or not the uh, the censorship of the, the censor censure of him by the American Conservative Union was justified well the, don't ask me to to judge what the American Conservative Union has done what is the attitude of the John Birch Society regarding homosexuality is probably what you're asking and, mm -hmm. and the answer to that is we think it's an abomination uh, biblically or legally what was the first choice? Biblically or legally? Well, certainly biblically. I mean, that, that was the crime that caused God to rain fire and brimstone on, on Sodom and Gomorrah. So biblically, there's no doubt about it. And uh, I don't think you can separate the biblical foundations of the United States from, uh, from the United States. Therefore, I think, you would deny homosexuals the same rights you have? Uh, I, I don't, well, I think that it's, it's safe to say uh, my own position, I don't think the society's taken a position on this, so I'll give you mine. I don't think homosexuals are born. I think that they are created. I think that, uh, I, I think that they, they, they gravitate that way. I don't think that there are people that are 
homosexual because they can't do anything else. But the question was, do they have the same rights as you? Well, w they have they have rights. Uh, same rights. Yeah. Well, which rights? You know, what what are we talking about? Freedom rights? of speech, assembly, right to work, right to uh, do anything they want, same as you do. Well, no, I don't think they have the right to do anything they want. I don't think uh, I want. My, well, by the I same... don't want my children being taught by them in school. I, don't I want... mean, do they have the exact same rights you do? Uh. Because Jefferson and those guys never mentioned homosexuals in the Constitution. No, they, they sure didn't. Well, I'm afraid that amongst them there were probably some, too, but I don't know. I, I... All right. Houston, Texas. Hello. Yes. Uh, Dr. McMahon, as well ago, when you were talking about uh, the redistribution of American wealth, Larry said that it was uh, done by common agreement, as uh, indicated. Through, through elected representatives. Yes. Uh, I'd suggest that... Uh, that those representatives are acting because their political life depends upon... Uh, well, if their political life depends upon it, that means the majority agrees with it. It's it's not done through wisdom. It's done through a... Uh, uh, well, if more people favor it... I don't follow, John. If more people favor it, why is it political to be for it? Well, why is it in this country more people uh, believe in receiving something instead of producing something? Is that, is that something... That's true. In other words, there are more people on welfare than off it, sir. Do you really believe that? Well, l listen, Larry, let's let's stop right a second here. Now, you seem to be indicating here that if, if the majority of people want something, that makes it correct. Oh, no, no, not at all. That's why we have a Bill of Rights. Well... To protect that. Yeah, but, but everyone... on, in a legislative body, a majority passes a law and the Supreme Court determines whether it violates any amendment to the Constitution. That's the way it works. So you get a whole, you get control of the Supreme Court, and then you can completely run roughshod over the Bill of Rights. Well, uh, that the system is that the I don't know how you get control of the Supreme Court since every Supreme Court uh, judge ever appointed has always some way disappointed the president who appointed him. Roosevelt thought Frankfurter would be liberal; he turned out to be conservative. Eisenhower thought Warren would be conservative; he turned out to be liberal. But the 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 system says the Supreme Court tells us what the law is. Now you got to admit that. You got no other system. No. Got a final arbiter. The, the Supreme Court decides whether or not a law is it's in keeping with the Constitution. And that right. law is passed by the legislature by majority. Right. In some cases, two-thirds. But remember, basically, the majority votes right. and the Supreme Court determines. Right. Okay, the majority passed an income tax law. The Supreme Court determined that's constitutional. That, no, that was an amendment. Yeah, but the Supreme Court eventually determined it is constitutional. Okay. That's the way the system works. You that's, wouldn't change that. No, way. well, that's the way the system works. That's true. And, of course, w are there any checks on the Supreme Court written into the Constitution? None. That's Yes, there are. What? Yeah, Co the Congress. Oh, impeachment. Yeah, but the Congress, well, you can't impeach because they voted on something. Well, you can impeach them for high crimes and misdemeanors. That's, that's what the Constitution you says. You can't, you that's can't right. impeach them for voting something's constitutional you or must, not constitutional. You must remember the Birch Society had a, a long campaign to impeach Earl Warren, and we were... On what grounds? On what grounds? Of, of violating his oath of office to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. He's there to determine. He's, he's there to interpret it. Yeah, but suppose he comes out with a decision and he says, we're not basing this decision on the Constitution or on the body of judicial precedent that has been built over the years, but we're going to base it on the writings of a Swedish socialist. He never said that. Yes, he did. The Brown versus Board of Education and the, Swedish, with that and the Swedish socialist was Gunnar Myrdal. That decision was nine nothing. I believe that the... You want an impeach only one? I believe that, the, well, that the intention... Nine the intention, Every conservative member of the board of well, the Supreme the intention, Court the that. intention with that campaign was to draw attention to what the Supreme Court was doing by focusing on the Chief Justice. And oh. if, in fact, the Chief Justice deserved that, then we also agreed that some of the others also deserved it. You therefore were against the integration of schools. What we're against, Larry, is the federal government's involvement in schools. Now, you were against not, the integration of schools. We're not against the integration of schools. We're against the federal government's okay. involvement in therefore, schools. Therefore, you would have liked Mississippi staying segregated if they chose to. Larry... Even though they didn't allow blacks to vote and the choosing to do so. Larry, you want to get right back to it. The John Birch Society do that. doesn't believe that the government should be involved in schools, period. Period. And if a state, period. therefore, wants to say blacks can't go to school, no, what no. would you do then? I would say that... that Suppose in a state would passed the law, blacks can't go to school. No. What would you do? You don't want the federal government involved. What, what do you do? What would the blacks do? What would you do? What would I do? I'd say to the blacks, come up to my state. and, and Move and from you, Mississippi. That's you, your answer. You come You come to my state. You or, be, uh, no, all right. You're not joking with me. No, no. Or okay. what I'd say You'd is say, this. You'd say, move from Mississippi. No, all right. What I'd say is this. I'd say, look, there are church schools down there, and, and uh, the churches that I like and I support. But they're tax-paying members of the body of the state. No, but, yeah, but if, there's no, but if there's no government involvement in the school, then there's no injustice either. <sighs> Uh, you're, the, you're the only person I've met in the last 30 years to disagree with Brown Baker. Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Hello. Howdy. Uh, first, I want to know 
How does a person become a member of the John Birch Society? Well, if you read some of our literature, you like what you read, you know somebody in the society, you, you just simply uh, find an application and you, you sign it, send it off. Uh, okay, somebody approves it at the local level, or if you don't know anybody, you write to us. We'll, uh, we'll see your application. We'll send somebody to see you. And the Belmont, Massachusetts? Bel okay. Belmont, Massachusetts, 02178. 2178. Okay, now I have some comments. I just wanted to make a comment, uh, especially about the debt problem that you mentioned. Um, I don't, I haven't heard anybody talk about this. It's it's amazing how the United States, well, I should say the banks, the New York banks especially, can loan out billions and billions of dollars to such countries as, um, you know, the Poland, uh, Poland, and like Brazil, who's just about to go bankrupt and. The banks count these as assets when these these countries are actually bankrupt, and all they have to do is declare bankruptcy, and the banks are wiped out. I've well, heard that. Well, what we found out in several cases, sir, is that some of these things are guaranteed by the government of the United States, that's and and you and I will pay the debts and pay the bills. That's exactly what's going. And that's why right now there's a tremendous surge on to increase the funding of the International Monetary Fund so that you and I can pay the debts of these foreign countries to David Rockefeller's bank in New York City. With John McManus, Waukegan, Illinois. Hello. Good morning. Uh, Jack Anderson was quoted in the Chattanooga News Free Press, and he said, and I quote, if any single member of Congress had to die, they certainly picked the right one. Would uh, Mr. McManus or you, Larry, like to comment on that, please? Hey, what? How to be taken out of context? I'd like to see the whole column. No, what I, were they talking about? He was talking about Larry McDonald. Yeah, but what did he mean? He meant that. Uh, well, he's crusaded against Larry McDonald most of Larry's political career. Oh, so you think he career. was Jack Anderson was supporting his death? He was absolutely. He was said that if any member of Congress had to be in that plane and die, it was a good thing that it was Larry McDonald. I'd like to see that column, because I can't believe it. Well, I'm afraid that it's true, Larry. Uh, I'd like you, to see the whole column. You're saying Jack Anderson applauded the death. No, I don't think that no, applaud is wait. the proper word. I don't think applaud is the proper word, but I think uh, uh, Jack Anderson was not sorry that it was Larry McDonald. Uh, may I ask another question? Sure. Uh, Mr. McManus, would you like to uh, comment and elaborate on the Birch Log that you uh, put together back in October of 1982 called the Real Goal of Nuclear Freeze? The Real Goal of the Nuclear Freeze is simply to build a world government, and it was a congressman from New York who said that. Uh, his name was Weiss. Ted Weiss, yes. Ted Weiss. He said that, and uh, I took it right from the congressional record, a speech that he either gave or inserted. I, I've forgotten Ted which. Ted would like to see... Uh, an international body control nuclear weapons so that people don't no, no, drop them on no, each no, other. No, no, no. He was said, on this program and said that. Well, what he said in this column was that what he'd like to see is that the nuclear freeze is the first step towards the goal of turning over all military to the United Nations so that the United Nations would then have all power. Would you like to see total disarmament, both countries? I think it's impossible. I think it's absolutely bonkers so you to, to even keep suggest it. More, but no, you don't like no. That what I say is what Cicero said before the time of Christ. He said, "If you mean to be, uh, if you mean to have peace, you must be prepared for war." Okay, we will uh, pause for news headlines. Come right back with John McManus on the Larry King Show. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System, your network for news and sports. <laughs> From the nation's capital, you're listening to The Larry King Show. Portions of this program are repeated in the Pacific Time Zone. Once again, Network Radio's number one interviewer, Larry King. Wichita, Kansas for John McManus. Hello. Good morning, Mr. McManus. I'd like to find out a couple of things, if I could. First one is, uh, has the John Birch Society ever been in any way considered uh, subversive uh, or investigated by the FBI for being subversive. Well, we asked the FBI to investigate the society when we were being charged with everything back in the early 60s. They said they had no cause to do so. We asked the Congress to do it, the House Committee on Un-American Activities. They said the same thing. The only official investigation ever conducted was the California State Senate in 1961 through 63, spent two full years and concluded that the Birch Society was given a bad rap and we published their report. It was so uh, honest and so favorable to our whole point of view. And they were Democrats, liberal Democrats, who put it together. Also, I'd like to ask, uh, what is the trilateral commission you referred to, and what is their initial goal? Well, I'll hang up and listen. The, the, the trilateral commission is an organization begun in 1973 by Zbigniew Brzezinski and David Rockefeller, 
grew out of a book that Brzezinski wrote called Between Two Ages, where he concluded af uh, that the United States should trade its sovereignty piecemeal to international groupings and then lead to world government. Brzezinski said it was for the promotion of German, Japanese, and American interests. And then he Common said, interest of the three. right, and then bring in other nations, and then communist nations, and then finally, on the next to last page in his book, he said world government. You think uh, Brzezinski is pro-Soviet? Uh, Brzezinski goes around masquerading, I think, as a, as a militant anti-communist, and I think his whole purpose is the same as David Rockefeller's. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's, it's like the Trotskyites versus the Stalinites, as far as I'm concerned. If you favor sovereignty, then you were against the Grenadian invasion? The purpose of the military arm of the United States government, which is why we hired them in the first place, is to protect the United States and to protect American citizens. If, in fact, American citizens are being threatened, as it certainly seems they were down there, and the Marines went in to get them out, I think that's fine. And now I think the Marines ought to get out. And I think the Marines ought to get out of Lebanon. I don't like the idea of the United States policing the world. Soviet Union used the same reason for going to Afghanistan. No, the, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. They said that they went to Afghanistan. Uh, called in by the leadership. Called in by the leadership that they had implanted in a bloody coup about six or eight months before, uh, Babrak Kamal. Uh, those people are Soviet puppets, and the whole thing was engineered. And they didn't go in there to free the people. They went in there to enslave the people. Larry, you, it's very, very different. Do you hate the uh, totalitarian of the right as much as the left? I, I, I hate totalitarianism, Therefore, you can't period. like the El Salvadoran government. Uh, I, I don't like uh, the government totalitarians. That shoots political prisoners. Well, I don't like anybody shooting political prisoners, but I don't condemn the El Salvadorian government out of hand the way you just did, no. Cincinnati, Ohio, hello. Hello. Um, I'd like to comment. I'd like to comment that uh, Mr. McManus, he is very wise, and I have a question and a comment on top of that that I'd like to know what day uh, in Cincinnati, the date, it will be in the uh, Holiday Inn. He'll be speaking. And also, I'd like to hear him comment on the NEA, humanism, the so called public schools, which are state schools, the ACLU. And, uh, uh, we're running into a whole bunch of things. I'm when gonna are you going to be in Cincinnati? Cincinnati next Tuesday night at the Holiday Inn North in the evening. Uh, what else? Humanism. Want to comment? Uh, secular humanism is the force that today invades the schools. It, it is the new kind of religion which is anti all established religion. It is the religion of uh, almost of atheism uh, and it has infected uh, our nation and it's very dominant in the schools. We've published a lot of material on that and find it you very, very offensive. You favor a merger of church and state? Absolutely not. I don't see any need for that. Then what prayer would you have in the school? I wouldn't have, look, Larry, my attitude about prayer in the schools is that the people who want prayer in the schools ought to have their schools, the people who don't want prayer in the schools ought to have their schools, and nobody should be forced to pay for somebody else's school. Well, the taxpayers have to build the schools. Why? Who should build the schools? The people. Did you know Well, they do it through their own taxation well, in their own cities. Oh, well, they don't have to do it uh, through governments. When I mean, you just do, people go out, well, what, are, what, are the, what does the poor neighborhood do well, for its school? Wh where did the people go to school when our nation was founded? Well, Larry, we, we had, didn't have 100,000 people. Uh, what, are the, no. what does the poor neighborhood do if it has to build its own school? Uh, the churches will come in there and build schools for what them. What if they don't want a church school? Well, then they educate themselves. Well, is it their right to go to you and to say, you put yep. up the money and educate me? Yep. It is? Yep. Well, there's there's a fundamental difference. Whole society's done it. There's a whole fundamental disagreement between because you and me. We think education's important. Oh, I think education's so important. I think it's back. so important that government ought to be out of it. It's so important that government ought to see that everybody gets educated. Well, all right. So government got involved, fact, and fact, as government totalitarian governments don't educate. Uh, oh yes, they do, Larry. The Communist Manifesto says free public education for all, and they have and it in the Soviet it Union. We say, thank heaven, we say. And they say it in the Soviet Union. I mean, you wouldn't Union. want poor people. You want rich people better educated. I don't than poor think. People. I don't think that if you take the government out, that the poor people wouldn't be educated, Larry. How? How would they be? Educated? I just told you, church schools, private schools, all kinds of individuals. Well, wait, but why would, would a private school build in a poor community if they couldn't pay for the school? All kinds of people would want to take those people into their schools in order to have them uh, uh, exposed to their religious point of view. That's what happened in our country. There were no government schools at the foundation of the yeah, United States. You were talking States. about a, there was no Medicare at the foundation well, of the United States, that's and right. everybody lived to 33 years old. Okay, but the, right back at the foundation of the United States, the literacy rate was higher than it is today. Today we have people coming out of the high schools, 12 years of schools. They can't read. They can't right? What do they know? They know drugs, they know promiscuity, they know pornography, they know all kinds of things that they shouldn't know, and they don't know how to add, they don't know how to write, they don't know how to read, they don't know how to compute, they don't know how to know any geography, they don't know any history, and... Uh, Some don't. Well, quite a few don't, Larry. And in Boston, where I, where I live, 
uh, it costs more to send the high school kids to the city of Boston schools than it would if they sent every one of them to Phillips Andover Academy, one of the most prestigious pre prep schools in the United States. So what's all the money going for? Philadelphia, hello. Hello. Yeah, I'd like to ask Mr. McManus, uh, how do you feel is the mass media's role in the demise of our uh, republic based on law? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, they, they've got us convinced that we're a democracy and that we've never been anything else but and that we must submit to the will of the majority. And, and, and How do the mass media the, do that? <laughs> well, I, you just ask people, just go around and ask people, and you'll find that that's what they think and that's what they believe, that, that, that this is a democracy and that the uh, majority rules. And that's, that's the attitude that people have and that rights come from government. And that's, that's fundamentally... Well, where did the Bill of Rights come from? The Bill of Rights was an expression of the Founding Fathers finally deciding that instead of just uh, empowering government, we'd better tell government what it cannot do as well uh, as what it can that do. That is correct. And, and they went and they listed what they considered to be their God-given rights, yeah, the ones they talked about in the Declaration. The first thing they listed was freedom of speech. No, and what did they say? It was the First Amendment. And what did they say? Congress shall make no law right. abridging right. the freedom of speech respecting the rights to worship freedom and of freedom assembly. of the freedom of assemblies and freedom of the press. Right. All right. So what does that say? That Such says... Couldn't be clearer to me. Well, what it says is that you already have these rights, and here we are saying that government can never take them away from you. Correct. All right. So now you ask the youngsters in college today... Now, who fights for you if they are taken away? Who fights for me? I fight for government. myself. No, federal government. See, the federal Mississippi government. took it away from a black, or New York took it away from a Puerto Rican, or Georgia took it away from a white person federal government comes in and says you're violating the Constitution, you can't do that. Well, you know, the, the, the Constitution, I, I agree. I agree that those kinds of things uh, can be done, but if there are other procedures that are already in the Constitution, why not use them as well? Bucks County, Pennsylvania, hello. Yes, uh, que question for uh, Larry King and a question for John McManus. Uh, Larry, uh, do you disagree with uh, Mr. McManus as far as uh, being a one-world uh, one conspiracy uh, Movement? Yes. I see. Um, Lar uh, John McManus, do you, uh, what, what do you think would happen to the people that wouldn't submit to these people if they were to secede in taking over this country? Oh, I think the same thing had happened to the people in this country that happened to the people in the Soviet Union. They'd be in slave labor camps, they'd be exterminated, they were millions murdered there. Uh, and uh, it wouldn't necessarily be the ones who refuse to submit because uh, when a totalitarian takes over, what he wants to do is control through terror. And so he indiscriminately picks up people here, docile people here, and uh, people who are op opponents there, and people who are even supporters there. And, and just by indiscriminately picking up people, he, d he creates the terror that he needs to control. Columbus, Ohio, with John McManus. Hello. Hello. How are you doing tonight, Larry? Fine. Uh, I think it's an excellent show. Thank you. Larry, I've got one question for you and one question for Mr. McManus. Larry, could you please repeat to me what you said was the first article of the amendment? Well, I didn't quote it exactly. I have the Constitution inside. Yeah, I've got it in front of me. and says here that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Don't you feel that by the government, and I see what Mr. McManus's point is, by the government getting involved in a Supreme Court passing a law, saying that, no, your kid came to take a Bible in a school. Supreme Court doesn't pass the law. It rules well, on laws already passed, sir. Right. So That's isn't the that, system. Isn't that passing a law recognizing the establishment or, or preventing the The Supreme Court up? interpreted that as meaning you cannot mix state and religion. That's the way they interpret I can, it. I just don't see that in there. I think that well, then you disagree with the Supreme Court. I disagree with the Supreme Court all the time. Okay. I got another but we live under a system in which they're the law, sir. I agree with you. I agree 100%. I just want to know your opinion. That's all. And I have a question for Mr. McManus. Uh, a lot of people tonight were calling in or quoting the biblical uh, biblical quotes for pro favoring and pro-against socialism. But I think one thing is important that a lot of people don't realize, and it's put by James Madison, they say was the author of the Constitution himself, he said that the ability, he wrote this in the Federalist Papers, the ability for the nation to survive by the people of the Constitution is not in the belief of the Constitution itself, but the fact that the people will uphold the laws written into the Constitution strictly based on a belief that these people will follow the law set by the Ten Commandments and the principles they hold in the Holy Bible. Precisely. And don't understand how they can totally wipe the original away from our young kids in the schools and tell them it had nothing to do with religion at all. And it well, was, uh, let, me, it? let me tell you that I think it's inevitable. I think that when government got involved in the school business, that inevitably you would get to a position where we are today.
I agree. And I don't think that the answer is to try to amend the Constitution, to put prayer in the schools, or to force people to pray or anything like that. I'm totally opposed to that. I agree with you. I think that people who want prayer in the schools ought to have their schools, people who don't ought to have their schools, and nobody should be forced to pay for somebody else's school. We'll be right back with John McManus after these messages. From the nation's capital, you're listening to The Larry King Show. Once again, here's Larry. Chicago for John McManus, and we'll have him comment on the Supreme Court in a moment. Hello. Yes, uh, Mr. McManus, a couple of questions for you, please. Um, you, I think you have a romantic view that uh, uh, sensitive Americans are going to rally behind the downtrodden, and um, I, that's not happening now, and I think that's very romantic to predict that that would happen even in the future without um, government help. I don't see how the people who are stepped on the downtrodden can survive. You know, they're uh, the, let, me, the, let me just simply go back and say what I said before. I think that the American people are second to none in the history of mankind for private charity. We always took care of those who were really downtrodden, but when government got involved in it, we increased the number of downtrodden by 10,000-fold uh, because then people said, well, I want to get mine too. Well, now now you've got I, fourth I, and fifth generations families on welfare, and it's destroyed those people. Well, I think that uh, a lot of the wealthy capitalists have uh, caused the, many of the problems that the poor have today, not just government. I think that you... Well, I wouldn't dispute that. Blame on that. I wouldn't dispute my, that. My other Welfare question, goes I believe to a lot of that uh, we will evolve into sensitive, caring Americans over a period of time. But to use government as a tool to hasten that, to cut a few corners, uh, such as through civil rights. Just the opposite happens, sir. Government destroys morality. Government destroys the moral fiber of the people by taking away their responsibilities from them. And what your goal is will not be achieved by having government involved in this. Your goal would be achieved by getting government out of it. What don't you like about the system of the Supreme Court? Uh, the Supreme Court makes law. The very first of article of the Constitution says uh, all legislative power shall be vested in the Congress, and well, that means that law. that means that no legis no lawmaking power rests in the Supreme Court. But they interpret and the, the law. You agree with that? Yeah, they can interpret so the law. Therefore, they say this law is unconstitutional. It's no law. But most of their decisions, Larry, should have been that it's not a federal matter. It's none of our business. But they're the ones that determine what's. See, the, the whole matter. federal system has been perverted. The federal system was the states were sovereign and supreme, and they were loosely connected for the purpose of mutual defense through a national government. they all government. agreed on a Supreme Court. And they agreed on a Supreme Court with very limited uh, powers. No, don't and say that. Well, the Supreme Court can hear any case it wants and rule on any case it, it can wants. Hear... I've never heard a lawyer argue against that. Oh, I have. I've heard a lot of. Could... I've heard a lot of lawyers. They hear? They not that they couldn't hear it. Well, once they hear it, they got to make a decision. Well, the decision. That... What do you mean couldn't hear it? They well, can hear any right. case. The you decision isn't yay or nay. The Wait decision. A minute. Do you agree that they can hear any case? Of course, they can okay. hear any case. Do you agree that there's nine members and they can vote five four in any case? Uh, no. They will. No. What? You don't. You agree they can hear it, but they, they can't can hear vote it. All right. Well, why hear it? You. I don't want to be. Put into a corner that. saying that that they Tell me, once can they, they hear, hear any case they want. Yeah, I've already said that okay, they the can hear is any yes, case. Must they rule on the case? When well, they hear. all right. What are the choices in ruling? Yay, nay, or it's none of our business. We have no decision. That's well, then the they one. They wouldn't hear it. They do that every day. Ninety-five percent of the cases are never heard by the Supreme Court because they say it's none of our business. Okay. Five percent they hear. All they right. say it is our business. So let's go back. That's to, the law. Let's go back to your question. They threw out 90 cases today. Can they hear any case? The yes. answer is yes. Should they hear any case? The answer is no. And who determines what a case? Well, they obviously they do. They do. So All right, are but they the, the Congress, of the, land? the yes. Congress of the United States, has the power within the Constitution to limit the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, and there have been congressional Wait, are you attempts. You saying Congress can pass a law that says the Supreme Court can't hear this case? Yes. Cannot. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me in history they have a passed Article law. 3, Section 2, I think it is. Tell me any law ever passed by Congress that says the Supreme Court can't hear this case. I don't know that it's ever been done, but they <laughs> can do it. And it's been well recommended by prominent uh, constitutional authorities for a long time. Columbia Falls, uh, where? Columbia Falls, hello. Well, Montana. Someone got on Comrade Larry's program and told the whole ugly truth. I say to you, Comrade Larry, and anybody else that doesn't love America. I love America. Oh, I, that, that, oh, I, I love America. You're out of line, mister. You think uh, only you love America? Philadelphia, hello. This is one of the things that's lovely about this country. Hello. Hello, Mr. King. Yes. Hello, Mr. McManus. Yes. Uh, given the history of the black population in America, without government help, how would you equalize the inequity and the disparity that this population finds itself in in the job market? 
housing, etc. Keeping in mind that a large segment of the American population isn't in favor of equal opportunity for black people. Well, and the second, ma'am, all I would do is the answer to your question is to continue to preach moral responsibility. That's one of the purposes of the Birch Society. We, our slogan is less government, more responsibility, and with God's help, a better world. We believe that less government is very, very needed. We believe that more responsibility on the part of individuals to recognize people for what they are instead of what their skin color is or their religion or their ethnic background. We preach that all the time. We live it. Each one of us in the Birch Society lives it all the time. And, and that's the answer. Please, uh, could I ask another question? Sure. How many black members is the black, does the uh, John Birch Society have? I can't tell you, ma'am. I don't know, but we have some. We have, uh, look, it, it's, it's denigrating to me to even suggest to you that, yeah, I've got a token black here or a token something else here. I don't like uh, to do that kind of thing. The membership application in the Birch Society asks for the name and the address of the person, and it asks for somebody at the local letter, uh, level to sign as, as an endorser so that they become a member. We don't know from our records. We can certainly tell when we visit the members around the country who are the blacks or who are the Chinese or the Asians or something like that, but we don't really care. And we, we intend not to make any surveys of that kind. Right back with John McManus of the John Birch Society. Uh, if you'd like to write for his book, The Insiders, it's $2, and uh, they'll send you materials as well, to the John Birch Society, Belmont, Massachusetts, 021 Seven eight. Back after this message. Once again, here's Larry with John McManus. He is the chief spokesperson of the John Birch Society, and we go to Pittsburgh. Hello. Yeah, um, Mr. McManus. Yes. I'm curious about something. Uh, I have a specific citation uh, that I've seen in a, in a newspaper, and I'll give it to you as long as I can finish my question. And that is, what if any um, feeling does your organization have towards the Nazis? We have absolutely no use for the Nazis. We want nothing to do with them. As far as we're concerned, there's no difference between them and the communists. I see. Well, did you know that um, the Washington Post published a statement that uh, late Representative McDonald offered a, um, excuse me, urged a Nobel Peace Prize for Rudolf Hess saying that he was an asset in the fight against communism? Oh, well, listen, Rudolf Hess was himself uh, a man who was involved in the Nazi movement and turned on the Nazis, flew a plane at great risk to himself, to England, to try to stop World War II and to expose what the Nazis were doing. Where is that written? Well, we McDonald, don't Rudolf Hess tried to stop World War II by... He, he, serious? Absolutely. He flew his plane. Uh, Larry, do you remember that? He flew the plane. Why is he in prison? He's in prison because his story would have helped to expose an awful lot of the same kinds of things that we're trying to well, expose. Where do you say that? I mean, what that's your opinion. You're entitled. Where, how do you know? Where do you get that opinion from? Uh, his family members, uh, others. There, there, isn't, there is some published information about Rudolf Hess. In fact, Larry McDonald put it all in the congressional record, and I have it in my files. He urged the Nobel Peace Prize. I don't know that he urged the Nobel Peace Prize. I never that's saw what, that. That's what this report in the Washington Post All right. Said. Well, the point simply is this, sir. They that, call him a war criminal don't, in the Washington Post, by the way. Well, of course. That's why uh, he's know, in prison the, for the Washington Post allied, uh, allied courts of justice set up internationally. The Washington now, Post, I don't think, is the, the end all and the be all. Sir, if you'd like, you write to me and ask for copies of what Larry McDonald put in the congressional record about Rudolph Hess. I'll be glad to send it to you. Fine, that's fair enough. Raleigh, North Carolina, hello. Yeah, Larry, just a quick comment and then two, two quick questions and I'll hang up. Um, I feel that if our government wasn't involved uh, with our school systems, that uh, it wouldn't be possible either at the university level or below for uh, people that were not as well off or rich that had money to be able to go to school. And my two questions for your guest are uh, his opinion of Martin Luther King and Jesse Helms. Thank you. Uh, I think it's an absolute travesty of justice for the United States now have a holiday named after a man about whom information had to be put in a sealed lock so that it couldn't be uh, known by the American people. If indeed this man... All information on all investigations is sealed. Well, the FBI reported that they had no link between Martin Luther King 
in the Communist Party. Well, the John Birch Society, the John Birch Society reported that there were plenty of links between Martin Luther well, King and the Communists. Well, the reports were wrong. The no, they weren't. No, they weren't. You no, believe Martin Luther King was a communist? No, I don't believe he was a communist, but I believe he associated with communists. He hired them, and when it was pointed out he had communists on his staff, he hired them in another city. He accepted money from them. He had them in his organization. He went to their conventions. He went to schools and was trained by them and so forth. And this is but easily documentable. Shaker Heights, Ohio. Hello. Yeah, uh, I've got two things. First, uh, I was listening to Open Phone America the uh, the night, the morning after uh, the Jesse had his out his outburst. Uh, this is the first question. I wonder, uh, Larry, if you could address some of the specific uh, specific arguments you had that evening. About what? Uh, to Mr. McManus about how uh, wrong Mr. Uh, Senator Helms was. Uh, I think Senator Helms. Uh was dead wrong, and I think the Senate voted him down. I think the president passed it into law, and I think Martin Luther King was the greatest American of my generation. And obviously, my guest totally disagrees. I, I certainly do. Right. I think Mar America owes Martin Luther King a greater debt than any individual in my lifetime. He prevented in my view, civil war. In my view, he created all kinds of conflicts everywhere he went. And I think that because was his people intention. Beat him up because he tried to check in the motel. His intention. He his intention. He stated. Bull in the Connor. He wasn't. Martin Luther King created Bull Connor by being beaten up by him. No, don't ask me to defend Bull Connor. I don't know much about Bull Connor. I know you the know image what he of did him. to him. He I know him with the a whip. image of him. I know. Well, when you hit him with a whip, are you blaming King or Connor? I also know that that Martin Luther King stated in the Saturday Review in April, I think it was in, in uh, 1965, his intention, what he intended to do with the civil rights movement, and that was to go into the streets and provoke. Uh, conflict and uh, it's called civil disobedience. He got it from Gandhi provoke, and the Boston Tea Party. Provoke conflict. All right. You know, you like the idea of that. I, I you think. You don't agree with civil disobedience. I, I don't think. I the don't think provoking conflict for the purpose of building government is a good idea. That's what this he intended. This country was born in civil disobedience. Well, all right, but not to build the Our power of government over everyone. Our disobedient. But not to build the power of government. To get over a government. Everyone. We're going to pause for news on the hour. A word from your local stations in an hour to go with John McManus who is the uh, chief spokesperson for the John Birch Society. Tomorrow night, Hedrick Smith and David Shipler of the New York Times. This is the Larry King Show in your nation's capital. And we'll be back right after the news on the Mutual Broadcasting System, your network for news and sports. <laughs> From the nation's capital, Mutual Radio presents The Larry King Show, Network Radio's leading coast-to-coast -coast talk program. Call Larry now at 703-685-2177. That's 703-685-2177. Let the connection ring. We'll answer when it's your turn. And now, Network Radio's number one interviewer, Larry King. Welcome back to another hour of the Larry King Show, Coast to Coast on Mutual, with John McManus, official spokesperson of the John Birch Society. Tomorrow night, Hedrick Smith and David Shibler of the New York Times. We go back to the calls in Alexandria, Virginia. Hello. Yes, uh, Mr. King, I'd like to have Mr. McManus' opinion. I agree with him on what he says about homosexuality being an ab abomination. And why would an organization like NICPAC hire a known homosexual as the head of it? Is that true? Is yes, it, it's very it's true. True that the head of I have, no, I have no knowledge of that. I don't. I don't know that. But I've heard those rumors. I don't know mm -hmm. that it's true. Well, it is very true, unfortunately. Well, don't don't ask the John Birch Society to defend Nick Pack. That's their organization. We that's don't. Right. We, um, that's not our. That's not our our group. Black Oak, Indiana. Hello. Hello there, Mr. King uh, and Mr. McManus. Uh, yeah. I was going to ask you a, a question about uh, this. If you were in the Congress of the United States. And you were going to uh, pose a problem with a president like uh, impeach. What's the question, sir? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this guy Weiss from uh, from New York. He proposed a bill of impeachment today. Is, yeah. is he automatically an Israelite? Who did he propose to impeach? Uh, Reagan, the ten con I think fifteen congressmen signed it today. For for what crime? Denying the press the right to cover Grenada. Oh. An automatic uh, uh, Israelite. What is an automatic Israelite? I don't know what that is. Jew. What? A fellow that is a Jew. Ah uh, yes, sir. Sleep it off. Washington D.C. Hello. Yeah, good evening, Larry. Uh, Mr. Right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Big matters. I think that you would do yourself a service 
when talking about the schools to make a very good distinction between government schools and public schools. You see, over in Russia they have government schools, and so the children are brainwashed immediately from day one until they get out of the school system. Here, we have public schools and government schools. Public schools are schools that would be on the same level as a public supermarket where the people participate and they're not controlled by the government. But we don't have that. We have a government school system here, and so the children are brainwashed. They are never taught the Constitution. They are never taught to read the Federalist Papers, Eliot's debates, Warren on the Constitution, or any of our old history. And if they did, they would learn one very important thing, that the uh, Founding Fathers forbid government to take the property of one person and give it to another, and that is in the Fifth Amendment. Well, that's that was my point earlier in the evening. Now, uh, I, I keep referring to what they call public schools in this country as government schools, and I think I should because the governments run them, and they take the taxation from the people, and they funnel it through the government to run the schools. And I think ultimately it's going to become exactly the same brainwashing thing intensely as it is in the Soviet Union, and I'm, I'm greatly fearful of it. Albany, New York. Hello. Hi, Larry. Really enjoying the show. Hi. Um, I'd like to ask a question of Mr. McManus and one of you, and then I'll hang up and listen if that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. First of all, for uh, Mr. McManus, uh, in your opinion, what t should the average American do to turn things around in this country? And for Larry... Um, <laughs> You're really excited tonight, and I'd just like to ask you, Larry, uh, what, by your definition, Larry, is uh, an objective, insightful, uh, fair interviewer? And I'll hang up and listen. <laughs> you want to do it? I think I'm an objective, fair, insightful interviewer. That's someone who listens, asks good questions, and uh, the guest responds to them. And uh, I think the more important question was the first one you asked to Mr. McMahon. Well, let me comment on that, Larry. I like a devil's advocate kind of an interview. I don't like a waltz. I think it's better when somebody is uh, trying to draw me out and make me defend my positions and maybe even disagreeing with me sometimes. What should an American do? I think he should get himself informed. And the first thing I'd like to have him be informed about is the fact that the United States government has built the Soviet Union into a military power that is now threatening the United States and it continues. Now we're feeding them. Now well, we're his question was, how does the average American change that if he agrees with you? He agrees. Well, first of all, he gets himself informed, and then he realizes that his own leaders are leading him astray. He gets involved in the political process, and he gets better leaders. Start at the congressional level, then get the senators. Then, ultimately, we should be able to get a, a president who follows up the rhetoric that he gives us, and most of them give us good rhetoric, and the performance is absolutely dastardly. Would you agree, John, that if you believe there's not much difference between Reagan and Mondale, that the hope of your side prevailing ain't too swift? Well, I, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that we're about to see all of our desires uh, accomplished tomorrow. No way. It, it, take, it has been going on, for, it's been going downhill. The country's been going downhill long before the John Birch Society got started. We took a great leap into socialism during Wilson's administration and a much greater leap during the Roosevelt administration and ever since. And uh, what is going on is terrible. The United States helped the Soviet Union uh, to get started, uh, bailed them out of their difficulties in the 20s, bailed them out of their difficulties in the 30s, built them into a world power in the 40s, has constantly pumped them up. Airborne communications parts, radar, tire cord factories, chemical plants, machine tools, automobile factories, food, foreign aid, money, dignity, missiles, uh, you name it, everything, we've given them. And there's documentable evidence that is absolutely irrefutable about this, and it continues to this day. Tucson, Arizona, hello. Yeah, Larry. Yeah, I'm a freelance journalist, and I travel across the United States on a bike, and I'd like to ask your guest. Um, he seems uh, uh, definitely to be a, a bigot and a racist, and I just... I resent that, sir. I don't think he is, sir. Okay, well, anyway, let me continue. Uh, I'd just like to know um, uh, why he hasn't uh, uh, had his membership and everything follow up on uh, what they really speak out about, which is, you know, being a, a good American and this and that and not having government interfere uh, too much. I'd like to know uh, uh, why most of the John Birchers I meet drive around in Toyotas and Datsuns, and if they have a bike, uh, it's a Honda or something. How come they don't? If they don't want so many people on welfare and they want all these private things, and 
why don't they buy American? Well, you assume, sir, of course, that uh, if you buy a Japanese car, that you are not buying it from an American who is earning his living that way, and that you are not taking it to an American mechanic who is going to repair that car, and that there are not an awful lot of Americans who are earning their living by importing Japanese cars as well. And I think that your conclusion is absolutely absurd. We'll be right back with John McManus after these messages. Once again, here's Larry. College Park, Maryland, with John McManus of the John Birch Society. Hello. Uh, yes, Larry, you keep on asking Mr. McManus questions. You won't let him finish. Uh, Mr. McManus, wouldn't you agree that since our country was founded uh, on, like, Christian principles, if our founding fathers had seen the state that our country's in now when it comes to Christianity, that they, they would have passed the law. They would have written into a law, and the reason they didn't is because they couldn't foresee something like this. And Larry, well, why didn't well, they do no, that? Wait a minute. Let's stop a second. A lot of the founding fathers weren't what you'd call Christians. They were deists. They oh. believed in God, but they weren't any particular religion. Uh, the, probably the, the, the attitude that I like most about this is the one that George Washington expressed. He said that uh, expecting that there will be moral principle without religion is absurd. That there has to be religion. And so what government should do is it should allow religion to propagate. It should allow religion to foster itself. Now, w we have a big problem in our country today, people turning away from morality, people turning away from responsibility and so forth, inviting government to take over responsibilities and to build power over government. I think in many respects, the problem that we see here has to be laid at the doors of the churches. The churches, I think, have dropped the ball. The churches are not preaching to people what the people should do in a responsible way. What they're doing is trying to get the people to get the government to do it for them. I think the, the churches are very, very uh, derelict in their duties, and I indict them all. We go to Black Earth, Wisconsin with John McManus. Hello. Hi. Uh, first of all, I'd like just to thank you, Larry, for, for demonstrating again tonight why you've become such a authentic, real, really folk hero for demonstrating just basic common sense in dealing with this um, uh, nut that you have on. Now, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Whoops. Stop. Stop. Okay. There'll be no personal name calling like I'm that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, uh, my apologies. Accept it. Go ahead. Okay. Secondly, I think a year from now, we'll, we'll know that Martin Luther King has been honored with a national holiday, and Senator Jesse Helms will be defeated by Governor Jim Hunt in North Carolina. Well, that could very easily happen, sir, um, but we're thirdly, not going to have the holiday until 1986. Thirdly, I'm one of um, over hundreds of students that are going to Iowa to campaign for Senator Gary Hart uh, running for president tomorrow. I'd like to ask both Larry if he's uh, considered having Senator Hart uh, as a guest. Well, we've been trying. Senator Hart twice had dates and canceled, and if you know anybody in this camp, tell them to call. It ain't our fault. Uh, I'll be glad to get in touch with somebody about it. Cause, uh, All right, do you have Rick a question of Mr. McManus? Uh, my question, Mr. McManus, um, don't you simply believe in the complex society that we live in today? I mean, you paint a very simple world of conspiracies and, and uh, all that. Don't you believe that uh, the government is an institution that, uh, that has helped lots of people? And no, I don't believe that. People? No, I think government's purpose is to protect our rights. And probably you can boil it down to a national defense system and a very few housekeeping duties. And if we had that, we'd be all be better off. But this argument about the fact that we live in a very complex society is one that was obviously used at the decline of Rome when the Roman citizens went to some of these people and said, where are you getting the power to put these socialistic programs in force? And I can just hear a Roman senator saying, my good man, you must realize we live in a very complex society. I think that argument has been used uh, ad infinitum, and I think it's a lot of baloney. I think the principles are what counts, and it's not complex. It's very simple. Pittsburgh, hello. Good morning, Larry and John, and uh, I have to say I agree with many of the things you said. Um, 60 Minutes had an article about Rudolf Hess, and they said that uh, supposedly the Soviets were going to allow Mr. Hess to uh, get out of prison, but the British vetoed it. Um, That's correct. Mm. Sounds kind of fishy to me, but uh, my question was... The British are the ones who will definitely not let him out. That's it, and sure, and when you go back, you'll find about the high crimes of Winston Churchill, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why Hess has been kept in prison. Um, my question, though, uh, as I say, I agree with many of the things you said, but uh, you seem to believe a great deal in the Bible, and uh, you seem to be very anti-totalitarian at the same time, and I'm wondering how 
when uh, we supposedly had a, a flood that killed everybody at one time, and you seem to mention the Sodom and Gomorrah thing, and uh, we're supposedly going to have a day of judgment at the end of uh, the end of time, and all this sort of thing. Uh, that sounds like pretty totalitarian rule to me. No, I don't that, reconcile this. It, it's a totally uh, different. Well, I, I'll put it in a totally different sphere, sir. I don't want man uh, having total domination over other men. Uh, when you equate uh, what totalitarian man has done with what God uh, is able to do and sometimes does, I think you're making a big mistake. I don't think you should equate them. You think uh, there's a lot of myth about Churchill, too? Oh, boy, do I ever. <laughs> I think Churchill brought on World War I. I think Churchill brought on World War II. Uh, did you ever hear of Tyler Kent? Tyler Kent was a code clerk at the U.S. Embassy in uh, in Britain in uh, the late 30s. His uh, ambassador was Joe Kennedy. He was asked to transmit a message to uh, President Roosevelt by First Lord of the Admiralty Churchill, and of course that's a violation of diplomatic procedures right there. The message, in effect, said, uh, I'm more American than most. If you will help me become prime minister together, we can rule the world. Well, uh, Tyler Kent, the code clerk, blew the whistle had his diplomatic immunity waived for him by his ambassador, Joe Kennedy, and he languished in a British prison for the entire duration of World War II. Jacksonville, Florida. Hello. Uh, yes. In a conservative state where Mrs. McDonald ran basically on her husband's platform, was the defeat of Catherine McDonald a rejection of the John Birch Society or a comment on it in any way? And I don't think so, sir, no. I don't think it was. I think that, well, I mentioned to Larry before the show started, I think it's true that in Georgia there are no elected women officials, and I think there's a lot of people down here who don't think women should be in office. I think there's a lot of other people who say that this woman who has two babies in diapers, two uh, tiny babies, uh, should probably be spending her time with them uh, Kathy McDonald herself said that it was a little hard to run a wholehearted campaign when your heart is half broken. So it's a, I don't think it's a repudiation of the Birch well, Society at all. Two, two more quick questions. Would you please name some of those congressmen and senators you admire and support? And Oh, Senator uh, Armstrong from Colorado appeals to me. Senator Sims from Idaho. Uh, uh, Congressman uh, Phil Crane from Illinois. Congressman uh, uh, Dreyer from California. Congressman Ron Paul from Texas and the Birchers plan to uh, strongly support a candidate. No, sir. No, no, they don't support candidates. No, you missed the beginning of the show. Mm -hmm. We we never do that. Never have. Not even supported a member of the Birch Society who was running for office. We're not a political organization. New Smyrna Beach, Florida. Hello. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. McManus. I want to ask. I, I feel that you're very misleading uh, in the fact that you referred to the large deficits in our country are because of the needy people in this country. And I don't think that that's true. It's because of our involvement in other countries and our lending and giving our money to other countries. Well, that's part of the problem. Uh, I thought you were going to say that the reason that we have such a deficit is because of defense. And I've written a piece on that subject, and I can't find it very handily here. But uh, it can be shown very easily with figures that the reason for the tremendous amount of deficit is because of these social programs that I don't think are helping people, I think they're enslaving people. I think we got a new form of slavery building in the United States. They call it chattel slavery. It's where people are totally dependent on government. Well, and it grows and grows and it's very, How very about bad. when government does things for you? Like uh, you own a home, government allows you to deduct your interest. Oh, they're not that's, doing uh, something for me. That's for your welfare. They're not doing it for me. What right, they're right. saying is that i got to pay in less taxes. You're paying less taxes because you own a home. Yeah. Poor people who don't own a home don't get that break. That's welfare. That's for John McManus's welfare, isn't it? Well, John McManus can take someone to lunch and deduct it. John That's McManus for your welfare. is. John government Mc don't have to give that to you. John McManus is working to reduce taxation for everybody. In fact, John, McManus, John McManus gets welfare. I don't think it's welfare. Any deduction you take is welfare. Well, isn't it? <laughs> it is something you can deduct for your welfare. All right. Isn't that true? All right, I guess so. The so the whole society's on welfare. So what you should do is uh, I should not take those deductions? Is that what you're saying? Correct. No. <laughs> no. no, sir, Larry. Well, wait a minute. All right, and you, you take your deductions, Yeah. and the poor person takes his food stamps. What's the difference? It, the deduction is not a gift. A it food, sure food is. Stamps, it, no, it isn't. Not a gift. It, it means that I pay less in taxes. They voted to give you a deduction for your welfare. You have a child, $1,000. All right. How'd you earn that? How did you I had a child, it? and they gave you a thousand dollar deduction for that. Well, I don't have a child. I don't have a thousand dollar deduction. That's for your welfare. Is is my tax rate the same as this poor person's? What does that mean? Well, both I, of you have welfare. 
Is, is my tax rate the same as theirs? I, I don't mean, know. Oh, yeah, maybe I'm in the 50 tax percent tax bracket. They're in the 15% the, uh, tax okay. bracket. Okay, but you got welfare. I, you call it welfare. I don't call it welfare. By the way, the I, poor I, person pay for food stamps. They pay taxes. They they pay they, they pay a proportionate share of taxes. Well, Larry, they contributed. L let's. How do they get a, a, a handout if they pay tax? A proportion. They go down? A proportion, you say? That's well. That's our income well, tax setup. We pay. All right. All right. Uh, all right. Now, <laughs> there are obviously people who get more from government than they put in. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then but we do get welfare. I get welfare. All right. Government gives me welfare. Look, look. I, what I'm saying, what you're saying, is something that I'd like to focus on and that is that government is already so powerful that they can tell us how much we can keep of what we earn and how much we can't and how well, much we... I'm at a loss maybe there's something I should have asked earlier isn't government us who is government you make it some thing government's no thing it's us you and me we're well, government uh, you and me and 240 million others are, no, it? government no. isn't a thing government is not us Larry as much as it's a constitution it's a rule of law by people Government is people, isn't it? No, it's the rule what of law. It? It's, it's not the thing. rule by people. It's the rule by law. Well, you agree with rule by law. I agree with but rule by law. But you have anarchy. That's right. Okay, so we are a government. We are the a rule government. by law, laws made by us. Right. Well, government is us. So when you attack the government, yeah, you're in a sense attacking us. Well, what I'm saying is, yeah, I'm saying the American people have dropped their guard and have allowed the government that they should be uh, controlling and that they should be uh, making sure stays within its bounds. They've allowed it to become... A, a leviathan that is devouring them and it's devouring it. Yes, I certainly agree on that. I think the American people are at fault. We're all at fault for that. Sydney Montana, hello. Hello, uh, good show. And um, first off, uh, you quoted from that Larry McDonald uh, was in the congressional re record for bringing up Rudolf Hess. Yes. Um, do you know, do you have uh, a lot of uh, knowledge about the congressional record? I think so. <laughs> um, there is a clause, I, I've got this out of Reader's Digest, that uh, congressmen can change what they have said in the congressional record. Oh, I know that, but there's no reason that Larry would want to change this. What he was doing was inserting something that had been published elsewhere, and he wanted it uh, widely known, and that's why he put it in the congressional record. Congress can put anything in it regularly once. That's right. Okay, good enough. Um, the second thing about J.P. Morgan, you brought that up earlier in the show, and right. I don't know... We weren't able to focus on it very much. Yeah, but go um, ahead. Well, maybe we could refocus. Um, could you re-explain uh, why, uh, how he was going about to uh, bring about the downfall of America? He was... All right, uh, that's too important to cut at this point, so I'm going to have him respond right after the headlines. We have a half hour to go with John McManus, who uh, has been with the John Birch Society since 1966. The Society celebrates its 25th anniversary in a month. Uh, in uh, with a major event in Indianapolis, and if you'd like to write to uh, John McManus, it's uh, John Birch Society, Belmont, Massachusetts, 02178. And if you're ordering the Insiders, you enclose two dollars that'll also send you paraphernalia on the Society. This is the Larry King Show, and this is the Mutual Broadcasting System, your network for news and sports. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. From the nation's capital, you're listening to The Larry King Show. Portions of this program are repeated in the Pacific Time Zone. Once again, Network Radio's number one interviewer, Larry King. With John McManus, the chief spokesperson for the John Birch Society. Before we take the next call, a little elaboration on the J.P. Morgan concept. Well, the J.P. Morgan helped to bring about the creation of the Federal Reserve System. And if there's something, you know, we could spend the whole evening on, on just on the Federal Reserve System. The government has now given the Federal Reserve uh, the power to increase the amount of money. That, that is what is inflation, and that is what has destroyed the value of the dollar. Uh, they used to require that the uh, uh, federal debt would be limited by uh, the amount of gold or silver in the Treasury. That's all gone. Those uh, restrictions are gone. And then the national debt was always uh, kind of a break on how much uh, currency could be printed and, and funded, and Congress constantly raises the national debt. It's, it's just soaring out of sight. And then the Monetary Control Act passed in 1980 gave the Federal Reserve the uh, ability not to only to have uh, American debt, but to have foreign debt as well as collateral to increase the amount of currency in the United States. Now, where did J.P. Morgan come in in this? Well, 
J.P. Morgan helped to precipitate a run on a bank, the Knickerbocker uh, Bank back in New York in 1907, created a panic, a banking panic, and then they carefully spread the word that what was needed was a central bank. And what they were saying was that, yes, there were people here in New York that were defrauded, a bank that failed, and what we need instead is a national central bank, which I say would have the power to defraud everybody. And the logic of it was absolutely uh, upside down, but a lot of people bought the idea. Uh, it, it got so bad uh, at this point, they were pressing so hard for it, that they actually uh, helped to create a third party movement in 1912 to defeat President Taft. J.P. Morgan financed and helped to create the Teddy Roosevelt Bull Moose Party in order to bring in uh, a third man in, in the, in the uh, arena so that Taft would be defeated. Wilson actually won the election and Wilson and Edward Mandel House immediately brought about the creation of the uh, Federal Reserve System. They waited until December 23rd of 1913 to have the vote in Congress when most of the Western and Southern congressmen had already left for Christmas who would have been opposed to it. And we got a, 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 a national bank, the Federal Reserve and System. And that is bad. Why? That is bad because it gives into one small area, one small group of people, the power to create uh, money to set the value of the dollar. And in my lifetime and yours, Larry, we have gone from the finest paper money that the world has ever known that was totally backed by gold, actually just a few years before we came on the scene, was totally backed by gold now to totally irredeemable paper. And uh, it's backed by nothing but the polish, the promise of a politician, which is a very dangerous situation to be in. And since 1939, we now have dollars that are worth about five cents compared to the 1939 dollar. Where did that value go? That value was stolen by government in a very clever process called inflation. And that's what's going on. And there are people, of course, all the time that blame inflation on businessmen and on labor unions and on a lot of other things because they've been persuaded that the inflation is actually rising prices, and it's not. Inflation, by definition, is the increase in the quantity of currency, which lowers all currency. And this is a very significant problem that ought to be addressed and ought to be understood and isn't being understood by, uh, by many of the American people. Philadelphia for John McManus. Hello. Yes, I had a couple questions for your guest, Larry. Um, I understand them say that they did not endorse any particular candidate. That's right. Um, I used to hear... Um, recordings called Let Freedom Ring, and they said they were by John Burke Society, and uh, this is in the early 70s, which, for example, they um, encouraged people not to uh, endorse Reagan, saying that he was a communist. No, no, and sir. And encouraging uh, endorsement of a person who was running on the American Independent Party. Well, sir, if in fact a Let Freedom Ring station, which was uh, a project of the John Burke Society, was telling people to vote for this candidate or not to vote for that one and we found out about it we stopped them we I told see. them no good this is, you don't use this name this let freedom ring it's not a john birch society thing we don't want any endorsements on those kinds of things roanoke virginia hello thanks uh, yes larry i'd like to thank you for having a program with this gentleman on i think what he says about his organization speaks for itself i have three questions i'll try to be as brief as possible Mr. McManus, uh, you seem to be one of those individuals who says that there are two kinds of people in the country, Americans and liberals, and isn't that a little bit neo-fascist? I don't even know what you mean by neo-fascist, sir, as far as I'm well, concerned. Well, would you agree with the statement there are Americans and liberals, no. a statement attributed to James Watt? No. Well, no, I, I, I guess James Watt did say that. I thought it was kind of humorous, but I don't think it's accurate. I don't think it's the right thing to say. I, I Listen, I agree that the... the, the political center that I think is the important part is not a narrow band. It's, it's, it's got some give on either side of it. But I don't think that socialism or anarchy or, and I think a lot of the people today are socialists and don't even know it. I, I think that they're outside this uh, spectrum in the center of this thing that, that I would call American. I think that they've uh, been misled. I'd like to okay. persuade him otherwise. I, I think there's a key question. Can you be in favor of socialistic concepts and still be a good American? I don't think so. You don't think so? What no. About, what about the democratic socialists in Europe who are elected to power? Well, that's Europe's problem. 
Now, that's not a problem. That's a democratic system. And they espouse a democratic socialism, and they win elections by well, doing that. They fine. take over by Bolshevik I, tactics. I, I think that that's a problem for Europe. I don't want it to happen here. But it I, is I'm not a for free democracy. choice. You're afraid of a free choice. Well, I agree that people have the choice to vote themselves into slavery. I don't want them to do that. That's uh, why I'm in the Birds Society. In other words, if a, a man ran on a socialist ticket for the United States Senate in, in Nebraska and won, you would try to not seat him? No, I'm afraid I, I wouldn't have any choice in the matter. I would say uh, I would say that our people out in Nebraska had done a pretty poor job of of uh, educating their fellow Nebraskans, and I as they might say, you did a poor job of elevating uh, of, of your people who you might have been for. That's true. I mean, but you can be a good American and disagree with facets of the system, can't you? Oh, I, thought, yeah. I thought what America's with, about with, is that's right within within some some amount of parameters, but socialism is the complete antithesis of Americanism, in my view. But, I mean, Frank Delano Roosevelt, we agree that Social Security was a, was a socialistic concept. That's right. You don't think he was less of an American for that? Yes, I do. You do? Yes. Yeah. Okay, third question. Why is it that uh, conservatives who take an anti-Soviet line, just like you do, so many decent, respectable conservatives have nothing to do with your organization? How do you explain that? Well, uh, uh, you know... I'm sick and tired of people who are not conservatives telling me who the conservative leaders of America are. Oh, uh, well, let's take William Buckley, who's been a critic of the John Birch Society and written... And uh, a dishonest critic of the John Birch Society. Right now, no one would deny William Buckley is a conservative. I would. You would deny it. Oh, I think William Buckley is... I, I You know, it's funny, there was a, a very left-wing professor who would admit that he's a left-winger, and I'm not trying to characterize the man. Uh, he debated Buckley up in uh, Boston one time, and... and he finally got to a point where he said, Mr. Buckley, if the establishment didn't have you, they would have to create you. And I found myself agreeing totally with that comment. I think William Buckley is the House conservative. I think William Buckley is the establishment conservative. And whenever it comes down to a very important matter, then you'll find William Buckley caving in and going along with the establishment and laughing about it and making it seem like, oh, just a great big joke and a social thing and everything else. Now, I also know that William Buckley was very dishonest about the John Birch Society back in the middle 60s. He, made, he, he waged war on us based on our attitude regarding Vietnam War, where we said that the United States should never have gotten involved in the first place, and we were the first ones to say that, and then we said that the way to get out of it is to win the darn thing. And that didn't mean nuking anybody. It simply meant stopping helping the other side, and we even recommended pulling the troops out and simply... Uh, making sure that they didn't get supplied from Poland and Romania and all those other countries that we were supplying at the same time. And and he went on and equated us with the left-wing movements, uh, the student demonstrators and everything else in the country, and it was a very dishonest thing. We'll be right back following these messages. Once again, here's Larry. Kalamazoo, Michigan, for John McManus. Hello. Yes. Uh, I have listened for better than an hour, and I am... Uh most distressed, he has not mentioned what he is doing to the sex. To the, the what? Sexes. The women. They are the primary welfare recipients because his uh, philosophy denies them the power. Uh, how do you feel about ERA and women's rights? Uh, we don't believe the ERA has anything to do with equal, equal rights. What it has to do with is equality, and we don't think men and women are equal. We think women are better. We don't want them to come down to equality. And but why the thing, you write a law giving them more rights? But the thing about equal, the Equal Rights Amendment that to us is the most compelling feature is not the first sentence in it, but the second sentence. The first sentence is the one everybody knows, that uh, rights shall not be debrided or abridged on account of sex. The second sentence says the Congress shall have power to implement this legislation. In other words, what it says is that if that Equal Rights Amendment is passed, which has been criticized by friend and foe alike as the most poorly worded, written piece of legislation ever offered in the history of the United States, it would mean that the federal government now has the power to legislate in any matter affecting men or women. It would be a Regarding fan its rights. fantastic increase, a quantum, several quantum jump in power for the federal government, besides being an absolute lawyer's delight, we would spend the rest of the century in court uh, adjudicating the very poorly piece of written you, piece of legislation. How then would you affect the superiority of women, which you believe in? I would. I would leave things very much the way they are, and I would see to it that if women were in the working, more pay for the same. If work. 
if women were in the working place, that they'd get the same pay uh, as a man. And How would you see to that? Well, uh, there are a host of laws at the state and local level already to carry that. There is absolutely no need for the Equal Rights Amendment if that's what you are for it. Uh, for. Arlington, Virginia. Hello. Yes, hello. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, Hi. Thank you for uh, letting me express my uh, comment here. I thought it uh, being important, uh, being uh, of Russian descent, and a kid during the McCarthy era, that uh, this information-giving organization is a little bit frightening to me, as it uh, seems quite opinionated. Um, Mr. McManus says that the uh, government shouldn't feed hungry people. Well, I say you should. The United sir. States, the government is the people. So is the John Birch Society. I would like to know what the society is doing to feed the hungry. It's preaching moral responsibility, sir. It's telling you and anybody else who's listening that if indeed somebody is hungry and is uh, in dire straits, that you have a responsibility to your fellow man. Do you believe in the county hospital? Pardon me? I'm asking Mr. McManus if he believes in the county hospital. Larry, what you're asking me is do I believe in government involvement in medicine? Yeah. The answer is no. No. All right, how would poor people get medical help in a hospital? Well, how did they get it before the government got into the hospital they didn't. business? Baloney. I just don't buy that. You they don't did. Think, you think America had great health care? I think that it was better at its period than any place else on earth, and it continued to get better, and I don't think it, it, it's gotten uh, better to the degree that it could if the government would stay out of it. The government get okay, involved... Okay, who would treat a poor person with cancer? How would they... What charity would give them $28,000 for major all... chemotherapy treatment? Well, you know, you talk about $28,000 for major... Why are these expenses so high? Why are medical expenses so high? There's been lots of articles written about this, the fact that the government got involved and they made this, 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 and this, and all of a sudden the prices went up to everything, they skyrocketed. I think a major cause of the skyrocketing of, uh, cost of medicine is because the government has been involved in it. Second question, sir. Uh, that was the, uh, pretty much my, uh, my point there. Uh, I would like to make one uh, last point, though, before I sign off here. Uh, Mr. McManus says, don't trust the Russians. Let's all try to remember that, to uh, distinguish between the Russians and the Soviets, all right? Okay, that's a fair comment. Blandro, South Dakota, hello. I'm sorry, you got to be there. Champaign, Illinois, hello. Good evening, Larry. How are you? Uh, fine. Great show. You're a good instigator. I have uh, one quote for uh, your gentleman from the Archie Bunker Society. And that is, if a free society cannot help the many who are poor, cannot save the few who are rich. And if this gentleman ever got a uh, refund check from the government, he re did receive it. Sir, one. sir, y y your your quote is something that I wouldn't I wouldn't blanch at the quote, but uh, you're saying society, and you're equating that with government, and I don't. And I think it's a big mistake. Society is the government. Well, you know, I mean, we've heard that several times. Larry has said that you're the government, I'm the government, and so forth. Well, Listen, sure, it's not the a place. The government is not people. The government is a contract that the people make. They establish a system. The system is the Constitution. It's not people. It's a it's a written body of law. It's not people. But people wrote it. Oh, well, of course people mm -hmm. wrote it. But once they wrote it and it's established, then we live by it. And the government itself is supposed to live by it. It's not supposed to govern you and me. It's supposed to govern the government. It's not people. But that's us. Well, excuse me. Okay, we'll be right back with John McManus following this message. Once again, here's Larry. Amarillo, Texas. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know if anything's been said about the bias in certain members of the media, but recently I saw bias taken to the point of cruelty and even sexism on CBS, on the CBS News when Mrs. McDonald was portrayed as callous in her lack of public remorse and at one point even referred to as the ice lady. Well, you know, it's funny. Kathy McDonald was damned if she did and damned if she didn't. Because she didn't weep publicly, she was called icy and callous. If she had wept publicly, she would have been painted as somebody not able to handle the pressures of a congressman. And uh, it was a very unfair thing, and I think you're very right to point that out. I want to jump in here a second. What did the CBS reporter say? Was he quoting someone, or did the CBS reporter say... The CBS reporter said that Mrs. McDonald is callous? No, but that's how it sounded. Here's a uh, now, wait a minute. What did he say? Okay, I'll tell you what he said. He said, at the end of the report, he said, the ice lady finally broke. And it showed okay, now, wait a second. The ice lady, a lot of people have called her the ice lady. 
Uh, by the way, Jacqueline Kennedy was called the Ice Lady at the Kennedy funeral in 1960. Any person who displays a great deal of cool under fire, I would regard as a compliment. See, when you said Ice Lady, I regard that as compliment because that means a kind of reserve, not breaking down. That's very good. So he said the Ice Lady finally broke down. Why do you regard that as demeaning? That's, I think that's good reporting. That's the way I took it. You what took it that way. Comment. Now, why isn't that good reporting? If she's if she's a person who has never broken down in composure and then does, that's pretty good reporting. Well, don't you don't think so, John? Well, I, I think maybe the terminology is a little rough, but I, I don't know. I mean, there's one way of saying ice lady, now, and there's another an way of saying ice lady. The caller began by saying, CBS was callous. Mm -hmm. I don't regard that as callous. Let me put it that way. Just my opinion. All right. Well, it obviously affected this man that way. Yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Dallas, hello. Hello, Mr. McManus. Yes. Why does the John Birch Society, which in many ways uh, simply reflects a, uh, let's say, a very conservative form of thinking, but where they really lose credibility with the public and, uh, and uh, say, William F. Buckley, for example, who tends to dismiss uh, the John Birch Society as, as uh, well, off the wall, mm. uh, is when they start putting out these uh, conspiracy theories about the Trilateral Commission, David Rockefeller, the Rothschild banking houses, et cetera, et cetera. Why, you know, if you... If, you know, it's one thing, sir. Is, one more thing. Go ahead. If you were to uh, eliminate all of that uh, really unsubstanti unsubstantiable uh, rhetoric from your uh, uh, positions... Then we'd be acceptable uh, to William Buckley. Sorry? Then we'd be acceptable to William Buckley. Well, you'd be... Uh, Sir, things happen because men want them to happen. If, in fact, men make things happen that are absolutely uh, destructive of freedom and destructive of the country that they've sworn to uh, uphold, then it is not unreasonable to consider that a conspiracy. The amount of evidence necessary to convince somebody of a point of view will vary. All right, and if you put Reagan in, in the same camp I, and, no, I, and part of a conspiracy, then, then when he attacks the Soviet Union, wouldn't that make David Rockefeller unhappy? Uh, once, Mr. Bush severely attacked the Soviet Union the other day. And then he went to Hungary, and he laid a wreath at the... He praised them for their human rights program, and he... Uh, well, laid, Hungary, Hungary's, uh, Hungary is probably the best-run communist country in the world. But still a communist country, Larry, and still a place where the people can't get out. Uh, they I'd have rather live in Hungary than El Salvador. Well, all right, fine. You go ahead Most and choose people. El Salvador. But you know, You'd rather live in El Salvador than Hungary? Yes, absolutely. Mr. McManus? Yeah. You, uh, me. Look, my point, sir, is this. The amount of evidence necessary to convince somebody of the existence of any or the, or the worth of any theory will vary. Uh, maybe I need less evidence to convince me that there's a conspiracy than you do. But, sir, I don't think you've taken a look at the evidence. But he's asking the question this way. And don't you Larry, think? Larry, particularly about the Rothschild. Why all right, don't you? All right, I got you, sir. Don't you think? When you go into a conspiracy and you label a Churchill and you label an Eisenhower and Reagan's no different than Mondale, you're going to start to lose a lot of people. Well, uh, you know, uh, I might, I might well, lose. Would you agree with that theoretic? I might lose some people, but I might gain a lot more. I might say uh, there might be some people finally say to themselves, well, somebody's finally saying it. And maybe those people will become energized enough to want to get some of our literature and, and become a part of, uh, of what we are. Uh, the, the points of view that we express on a show like this, we get a chance to glancing blow, touch this, and glancing blow, touch that. It's backed up by a lot of evidence. And what we'd like people to do is to try to find the evidence. Please. Nothing wrong with that. Last call, Lexington, Kentucky. Hello. Yes, Larry, good show. Thank you. Uh, I would like to get back to the uh, question about the Martin Luther King holiday, if I could. Go ahead. Uh, a, a short time before... Uh, the uh, King holiday was made a reality. James J. Kilpatrick suggested that uh, if, in fact, there was any truth to the allegations by Mr. Helms, that these things ought to be investigated and that the American government was going to look extremely foolish if there was any truth to these allegations. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Well, the president himself said that. You know, Except the FBI cleared him, sir. Well, look, the FBI is not the only body of investigation. But they were the, the ones that States. investigated. Well, all right. I told you already that we investigated, too, and we turned up all kinds of evidence about the uh, communist connections. Now, we never called King a communist. Well, we don't if you believe have lunch he was with a, a communist, doesn't make you a communist. If you go to their training schools, Larry, it's something else, isn't it? What about the evidence that's been locked up that won't be released? That's that's every American gets that, sir, and the reason is... No, they don't, Larry. Wait, hold on. When, when you're investigated by the FBI, and I was close to the FBI in Miami, 
Every call, every insinuation, everything ever is written or said about you goes into that file. No, sir. It does so. Well, if you wait, call sure. the, if the FBI is investigating you, sir, tomorrow, you the caller, right. and I call the FBI and say you're a homosexual, that goes into your file. The reason those files are sealed is just because of that. No. No. Well, all right. Let's make a distinction here. Those files are sealed. That's true. The FBI information, it's not yours to get. Absolutely and it's not, not. But there was a special court order on this particular subject by a, a judge here in the District of Columbia to take those files of the FBI and to lock them up for 75 years. And if we should make a holiday, a national holiday, for a man, honoring a man, about whom somebody had to do that in order to keep this information from possibly being available, then I say we made a mistake. I thank you very much, John. And the address again for John McManus is the John Birch Society, Belmont, Massachusetts, 02178. If you'd like the book, The Insiders, send $2. Our guest, John McManus, Chief Spokesperson for the John Birch Society.